Welcome everyone to the Cartesian Cafe. We're very lucky to have Scott Aronson here with us today. Scott Aronson is a professor of computer science at University of Texas at Austin and director of its Quantum Information Center. Previously, he received his PhD at UC Berkeley and was a faculty member at MIT in electrical engineering and computer science from 2007 to 2016. Scott has won numerous prizes for his research on quantum computing and complexity theory, including the Alan T. Waterman Award in 2012 and the ACM Prize in Computing in 2020. In addition to being a world-class scientist, Scott is famous for his highly informative and entertaining blog, Shtetl Optimized, which has kept the scientific community up to date on quantum hype for the past two decades. Welcome, Scott. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Uh, thanks so much, Tim. It's great to be here. Yeah, great to have you here. Uh, you're clearly one of the best guys to talk to about quantum computing. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to get to know you better as a writer and thinker uh, and dive a bit into your famous blog. Uh, you have such a unique writing style. It's, it's some mixture of uh, you know, refreshing honesty, self-deprecating humor, scientific profundity, and it's really inspired so many people, uh, including myself. I just wanted to Here's get your time. <laughs> I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on blogging overall. You, you know, you've, you, you're part of this small vanguard of scientists who began blogging early on and continue to blog people like John Baez, Peter White, Sabina Hassenfelder. Mm -hmm. um, what's the journey been like? Are there any highlights you'd like to share and, and how, how has blogging shaped your uh, scientific career? Well, when I, I started my blog, it felt like I was very late uh, to the to the game, right? Uh, uh, so from like 2002 and, and three and four, uh, um, you know, people kept telling me, well, gosh, you should start a blog, Scott. You know, you seem to have a lot of a, a sh a strong opinions about things, you know, and I, and I gave them all sorts of reasons why that would be a terrible idea. Uh, you know, like, you know, I could put my foot in my mouth, I could say the wrong thing and could be blamed for it. You know, I'd have to, it would take up all of this time that would, you know, detract, you know, all, all, anyway, long story short, all of those reasons turn out to be valid reasons. So, <laughs> you know, but, uh, 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 I think in 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 late 2005, I just you know had had you know as a little experiment, uh, you know I I had guest posted on Lance Fortnell's blog uh, previously, you know, so that that had given me a little taste for it, and so I started a, a little thing on on Blogger, and I wasn't sure if anyone was going to read it. I, you know, it might just be a few posts, and then it would go away, right? But um, but uh, um, you know, for 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 whatever reason, it 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 did attract an audience. And, and then, you know, I think what, what happened was that, you know, around 2007, you know, you started seeing the beginnings of, I would say, you know, these sort of crazy misleading quantum computing hype, you know, that, 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 it, that is now, you know, you know, now, now, now there's, there's, you know, 50 times as much of it. Right. But, uh, uh, but, but, you know, you saw the beginning of it there and it was weird because, uh, uh, you know that like like within the quantum computing you know research community like everyone knew that you know that this stuff is not serious right that you know these claims in the in the popular press are, are you know are, are wildly exaggerated or you know blah 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 or or, or 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 just completely misunderstanding basic concepts right but then but then those things would just keep getting repeated right and and uh, and and somehow there was there was no one who was who was just saying, look, you know, uh, you know, to, to just taking stuff that is not controversial at all within the academic community, and then just saying it for a broader audience, you know, where where suddenly it was controversial because it was going against this 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 narrative that you know people were were using to raise funds and and, and so forth, and and so then you know my my blog kind of fell into that niche just because of the the lack of an alternative. You know, just because it just seemed like you know, there if if uh, um, it just it just became a place of last resort for for uh, you know getting that message out. And then what happened was that you know, jer like science journalists would start calling me, you know, uh, 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 or you know, would sort of use my blog as a uh, as their jumping off point. And then you know, not only about quantum computing, but about you know whatever other science stories. And so then that that that, that, that that's how it kind of picked up this 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 momentum, I guess. Um, 
I don't blog as much now as I used to. Uh, you know, I mean, for, for one thing, I have two kids now. Uh, I have students and postdocs, you know, so, 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 so real life can be annoying, you know, that way that it gets in the way of blogging, right? And then, you know, also, um, you know, I, I feel like, like in the, in the 2000s, you know, it was just fun. You could just, you know, explore ideas. You could, you know, try to push the envelope, you know, even, you know, be controversial. Like, you know, people would argue with you, but, you know, no one really cared that much. You know, also, also at that time I was, you know, I was, I was a relatively unknown postdoc, Right. And now, like, if, if I say one thing that's wrong, it's, you know, Scott Aronson, director of the Quantum Information Center at UT Austin has, you know, uh, uh, put his foot in his mouth by saying such and such. And that'll be all over Twitter and all over. Right. So, you know, it's like, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't think that I'm I'm cowardly, you know, and, I you know, I have taken all kinds of controversial public <clears throat> fans on my blog. Right. But it's going to, you know, I have to think very, I have to think carefully about it, right? About, you know, and, and am I willing to spend the time to deal with all of the blowback that I would get if I talked about, you know, this issue, right? And, you know, maybe maybe I should, you know, just post things on on on, on Facebook, right? Where it's, you know, a little bit lower stakes, right? And, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I do feel like the internet has become more of a battle zone and, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I feel like I, I still want to use my blog for, for outreach, but it's, 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 it's somehow it, it, it's harder to, to just play around and have fun with ideas than it was years ago. Now, as for its effect on my career, I mean, that's hard to say. Uh, I am very happy that, you know, I do have research papers that, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, where, where, where my blog kind of played a major role in their origin. You know, I did a survey about the busy beaver function a couple of years ago, and, you know, I had to keep expanding that survey because of new observations, uh, new ideas that came from readers of my blog, right? So, yeah, I mean, you know, no, 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 that was kind of perfect for that because it's kind of a, you know, a recreational math topic where, you know, with a very low barrier to entry. Um but, you know, also in, in quantum computing research, I mean, you know, I have posted things on my blog, like, like you know, here is this quantum algorithm called, you know, this QAOA. Uh, this was maybe, um, 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 I don't know, eight years ago or so, right? Here are the, you know, this amazing claim that it gets a better approximation factor for an NP complete problem, you know, and then a bunch of classical computer scientists say like, no, we can beat that classically, right? You know, and, and, and that's because they, they saw it on my blog, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, it's kind of been a clearinghouse and connecting people to, to, to each other or to, you know, results that they might want to pay attention to. Um, you know, and yeah, and 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 it, it has had you know some some impact on my on my research, I guess. Uh, not you know not a, a decisive one. Uh, you know now, uh, um, you know it, it is hard to separate. Like when I you know went on the job market, uh, uh, the the blog meant that you know people might have hated me, but but they, but they but they knew who I was, right? <laughs> so so um, you know I do I I, I am kind of read is you know i do sometimes try to maintain some distance between you know uh, uh, research and blogging like not hawking my you know my own papers on my blog too much because you know i don't want to feel like i have an unfair advantage you know over people who are not blogging right sometimes i'm just too excited about something that i'm working wow on. you're you're too yeah. kind i feel like in the like for example with with machine learning it's all about you know drawing up the twitter audience and getting uh, people <laughs> to see your paper right so yeah so i, I think so, you're so I, yeah, I i have still refused to get a twitter account just because it it twitter reminds me too much of like the cafeteria of my high school uh, <laughs> like, you know this was like the whole thing that i was you know trying to get away from in life right and uh you know i, I have lots of friends who are on twitter you know i read some of them I, you know i mean I, you can't ignore what what it, you know people are saying on twitter uh, all, uh, all the time even even if you might like to uh but i, I decided that that, that 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 the blog is enough for me and uh you know, the blog, you know, at least if people are angry at me, you know, they have enough space to spell out their argument for why. 
Mm. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're alive and well, and, and so is your, your blog. Um, well, thank you so much. This year, something interesting happened to you. You're, you're, you're on sabbatical, I guess, and you decided mm -hmm. to work with OpenAI a bit. Yes. Can you say a little bit about that? Because I guess that's maybe yeah. a little unexpected, at least when I saw that. Well, how is that a continuation of the things you're interested in, and, and how does that yeah, fall into yeah. your interest? Well, okay. Yeah, well, well it, it, it actually, you know, th 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 this actually did start from my blog. Uh, oh, another example well, they, how, like how it shaped your so, career. So, yeah. so in my in my comment section, someone was was saying, uh, uh, well, you know, Scott, like, how much money would it take to get you to stop wasting your time on all of this quantum computing theory? And you're know, welcome, <laughs> like, the one problem that really matters for the future of civilization, which is AI safety. Right. Mm. And, and actually, on that front, are, aren't you? Are, this is where your self deprecating humor comes in. Aren't you, didn't you say something like, didn't you say something like, uh, I uh, pr uh, uh, prove things that we can't do using computers we haven't built? Well, something no, to that okay, effect. No, I, I study what we can't do with computers that we don't have. Yeah. Exactly, which is yeah, hilarious. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, of course, <laughs> that is a lot of what I do in, in quantum computing, but. Uh, um, you know, I, 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 you know, now, 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 one thing that happened since I started my blog in uh, 2005 was that, you know, a lot of the same people who would uh, read my blog were the people who were part of this rationality community that formed around, you know, Eliezer Yudkowsky and uh, Robin Hansen and uh, people like that, right, who, you know, also had blogs uh, uh and you know that that you know were, were were read by a lot of the same people and so i became very familiar you know early on with with their ideas which were you know uh uh, uh many of them involved you know the uh that well uh ai you know might you know in the relatively near future just you know exceed human abilities you know across just about every domain and you know this will you know by by default if we don't do anything else this will be very, really terrible for humans and uh, you know and and we should maybe just drop everything else that we're you know we're you know even even climate change and nuclear war these are all just kind of like minor worries compared to this worry about AI becoming super intelligent and taking over the world and. Uh, um, you know, and and uh, um, um, uh, and and we should really think about you know how to prevent that and how to make sure that the AI is friendly, and 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 I I you know so I was familiar with this and and I always kept it at at, at arm's length, right? Uh, because you know it's I mean I mean you know part of it might have just been it was sort of it was presented in this very kind of prophetic way, right? Like. Uh, uh, it, you know, it did not look at all like academic research, right? And, you know, it struck many, many people as looking kind of like a cult, right? Uh, uh, you know, with like uh, uh, these sort of messianic prophecies and these, you know, right? And, and uh, um, you yeah, and now, now, rationally, I could not say that I knew any reason why this was impossible, right? Like, yeah, you know, science fiction has, has been there for, you know, generations before, right? Asimov was writing about such things in the 1940s, right? And of course, I, you know, read his, his stories as a kid and was, you know, hugely influenced by them, uh, by, you know, his, his three laws of robotics and, and, and so forth. And, and uh, so, you know, I can't say that any of that is impossible, but First of all, you know, I did study AI uh, somewhat uh, when I was a grad student at Berkeley. I spent a year doing machine learning before I sort of fell in with the quantum crowd, uh, you know, which I, I, I sort of secretly, I guess I wanted to do quantum computing, although it was the, the AI people who had uh, recruited me to Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, and, and, and even in 2000, you know, I, I, uh, 2001, you know, I had a sense, yeah, that this machine learning thing might turn out to be pretty important. Right, but uh, it, it was just so hard to prove anything, and uh, and I just it still I, is. Yeah, yeah, right, right exactly. <laughs> and I just I just had more fun doing quantum mm. computing, and and I uh, uh, mm. that was that was kind of the the, uh, the 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 reason I got I got drawn there. Uh, but you know, then you know, th th this was you know, this was all more than a decade before the the um, the deep learning revolution, right, and. And and at the time, you know, you you could you could look at the state of AI and say like, this is this is not actually you know 
anywhere close to human abilities, you know, in, in, in an interesting way, right? This is, and, 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 and who the hell knows how long that could possibly take until you get an, an AI that you would really want to describe as understanding something. Right. And, you know, it could be hundreds of years for all we know. Right. And so so then, you know, you get to this position. Actually, my 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 um, 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 mentor, uh, my first year in grad school was uh, named um, Andrew, uh, who yeah. is uh, uh, who is now a very famous you know, machine learning person. But one thing he's famous for is for this quote that uh, uh, worrying about, you know, AI taking over the world is, is kind of like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. Right? <laughs> it's like, you know, it just like it's so far in the future that like even if you decided to be worried about it, it's like, great, well, we'll, 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 we'll what do you want to do about it? Right. Like, like I, I didn't really see a. Uh, anything that looked like a clear research vision, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But now, you know, starting around 2011, 2012, you know, uh, I think the thing that, that very, very few people predicted was that just taking the same ideas that had been around for decades, right, of, you know, uh, back propagation, neural nets, uh, you know, that, that hadn't worked that well before, right? But if you just scale them up enough and you just train them on enough data, then they do work, right? Like usually you take a non-working idea and you scale it up by 10,000. It's still a non-working idea, right? <laughs> but, in the, but in this case, no. In this case, it started working and it started, you know, handling a, a translation and recognizing images. And then within the last few years, we have seen these absolutely astounding uh, uh, new artifacts like GPT and uh, DALI, and, uh, you know, and, and Lambda and, you know, and, and, and the amazing things that DeepMind has done, you know, uh, um, Alpha Zero, uh, uh, Alpha Fold, um, Alpha Tensor, you know, that discovered new uh, matrix multiplication algorithms, right? I mean, so we now have AIs that can, you know, make art, I mean, you know, well enough that it's going to sort of revolutionize the commercial art industry, you know, they can write poems that like, if I didn't know, it came from the AI. I would think it was just something from the New Yorker or whatever, right? And um, you know that that all came about because you know a few new ideas like transformers and so forth, but mostly just scale, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so we're you know and 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 a lot of my colleagues I think are still in denial about this. Right? <laughs> They're still in the mode of like trying to invent reasons why it doesn't really count or it doesn't really matter, right? And and I think that um, it does uh, really matter, you know, like regardless of whether you say it really understands or it doesn't really understand. Like we're now at the point where just the existing AI. Right is already going to have massive effects on civilization. That just you know, in fact, I'm 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 astounded that it's like, um, you know, the 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 the, the sort of you know the the the, the, the world has not woken up to this to the you know extent that it should have. It you know it it reminds me of like when I was an adolescent in like 1992 or 1993, and I first saw this thing called the World Wide Web. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, why isn't everyone using this? Why isn't, <laughs> why isn't this the biggest story in the world? And, and within a year or two, it would be. Right. But, you know, uh, you know, when, when, when you use GPT like that, 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 that is how I feel right now. Right. And so so I, I had already been primed that like this is a thing to to think about. And also this this sort of suddenly changes the calculus about, you know, the 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 AI safety program. Right. Because uh, because now there are actual AI systems that are going to be deployed in the world or hopefully, you know, GPT or something like that is not going to destroy the world. Right. But, you know, it's going to be used by 100 million students to, you know, write their term papers. Right. Or at least they're going to be tempted to use it for that. Right. It's going to be used for propaganda. It's going to be used for impersonating people. Right. It's going to be misused in all kinds of ways that, you know, we can try to think about and we can think about how would we mitigate that. OK. And and uh, and these questions seem continuous with the eventual questions that you would face about, you know, how do you deal with an AI that is just smarter than humans are across just about everything.
right? And so, so now there's like an actual research program in AI safety where you can you can get feedback from the external world. Like you can have something external to just, you know, your pure thought that is telling you when when you've got it wrong. Right. And and to me, that is kind of the crucial prerequisite to making progress in just about, you know, any any area of science, right? Like either you need experiments or you need math. Right. <laughs> but you know, you need something to tell you when you were wrong. Right. And so, so, so then, um, um, so, so what happened was, you know, that this, this person, uh, this commenter on my blog was asking me would I work on AI safety. And I'm like, you know, well, you know, it would just depend on whether I could find a concrete problem to work on. Like maybe I'd be open to it. And so it turns out that open AI people read my blog. And uh, so then they got in touch with me and they're like, are, are you serious about this? And I'm like, oh, shoot. Now I have to figure out, was I serious? <laughs> so, so, right. I, I, so I so I talked to them. Well, so, and, somebody else put money where your mouth is. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, no. And, and they said, you know, you can stay in Austin, you know, where you know, your family and your students are. You can still run your research group and we'll just, you know, sort of like buy you out of, you know, for, for so, 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 so you don't have to teach for the year. And, you know, and you can think about, you know, we want you to think about what can complexity theory contribute to AI safety. And they gave me some, some examples of what they had in mind. Uh, actually, the, the whole safety group at uh, OpenAI was started or co-founded, I should say, by a former student of mine uh, from MIT named Paul Cristiano. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so Paul did a P, you know, worked with me, then did a PhD in quantum computing at Berkeley from Umesh Fazarani, who, who, who was also my advisor, uh, and then switched from quantum computing fully into AI safety because he mm. decided that that was just more important to <laughs> the world. And so helped start the safety research at OpenAI, has since left and now has his own AI safety organization. Okay, but but Paul had really convinced the AI safety world that that uh like maybe like like interactive proofs, like you know, like like in, in theoretical computer science, we know a lot about how a very, very weak verifier can uh sort of force a very, very powerful prover to do its bidding. Right. Mm. And like, ah, so that's exactly the kind of thing that we need for, AI, you know, for for safe AI. Right. We need to know how to control these entities that are actually much smarter than we are. Mm. Right? Mm. Verify their behavior. And so mm. I said, OK, you know, it, it's not it's still not completely obvious what I'm going to do there. But, you know, I can see that 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 that, that, that there is going to be technical, you know, there is going to be actual progress that can now happen in this field. And may, maybe it would be exciting to be in on the ground floor of that. And so I'm spending a year and I'm thinking about various things. And I guess if we do a different conversation, maybe it maybe sure. at the end of the year, you can ask me about AI safety <laughs> sure. and tell you what, what thoughts I'm having about that. Okay, well, th thank you for that, Scott. Let's actually talk about quantum computing. <laughs> All right, then. All right, at sure. long last. Um, yeah. So... Let's see. It's. I, I think this is a, obviously a very timely topic. We we did mention that Nobel's uh well uh, or a Nobel Prize was awarded to several individuals uh, this year for their uh, work in verifying uh, Bell's inequality. So so uh, mm -hmm. quantum physics has has been in the uh, uh, popular uh, uh you know mind space for a while now, um, and of course you have a lot of uh, uh you know thoughts and expertise on this, and. Uh, part of that is also sort of putting the hype uh, on the right footing. Of course, uh, you know, quantum computing is important and worth setting. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing it. On the other hand, as you mentioned uh, through your blog, uh, there's a lot of overhype and, and, and you have, I guess, yeah. a moral obligation to fight that off. And I thought what would be unique on our episode is that because we have a whiteboard, we can actually explain quantum computing in a way that's more than what an audio based podcast can do. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, also even more than what say a typical blog post can do, but also, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of get, get the right perspectives with the technical detail oh, so that we really can kind of get the idea across. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think one way to start out is just giving a high level of what your take on the field is. And the way we're going to start out is by looking at uh, an excerpt of this funny Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon that you are 
a co-author of. It's a long cartoon. You know, maybe there's like 30 or 40 of these kind of uh, images. I, I just took the relevant ones. It's called The Talk. Uh, sort of a, obviously a, a play on on a typical talk that an adult would have with with their child, uh, but in this this is the talk to sort of get the story straight about quantum computing, right? Yeah. Do you want to do you want to say in your own words a little bit about this cartoon and what you want to convey about the, how to understand quantum computing at a high level? Uh, yeah, yeah. So 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 I well, I got to know Zach uh, Wiener Smith, who is the uh, author of SMBC Comics, which is this you know fantastic. Uh, uh, nerd web comic right uh, uh uh it's uh um um it's it's it, it, it it's the one that's not xkcd <laughs> the other one okay but uh um um and 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 actually like uh uh, uh the you know uh, um, um zach and i decided to do this comic about quantum computing where like a, a, actually the the mouse over text like if 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 you click you you can see Zach saying now um 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 out nerd me now Randall right Randall Monroe being the author of XKCD right but uh uh so so we 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 uh um uh, uh it, it's basically like like a a uh uh, a parent uh, discovers their 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 their, their uh, 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 mother discovers her her son uh, in in his bedroom with with all of these trashy popular magazines <laughs> that are that are that are that are misexplaining the basics of quantum computing right saying that a, a you know a super you know a qubit is just a bit that is both zero and one at the same time you know a quantum computer can solve a hard problem by just trying all of the possible answers at once and then just magically picking the best one, right? It can store, you know, two to the thousand bits of information and only a thousand qubits and, um, and, and, and all this, this stuff that, you know, that sounds like uh, amazing, like, you know, too good to be true almost, right? And in a way it, it is too good to be true, right? It's all try, trying to get at something true but uh, just sort of um, skipping over, you know, the like, subtleties that are actually really really crucial to the story right and to sort of why this story is sort of weirder than any science fiction writer would have had the imagination to invent right and and so then the the the, the mother just kind of has to explain like look you can't understand this without talking about you know linear algebra a little bit, <laughs> right <laughs> and uh, um you know what is a, a a qubit, which is the basic building block of a quantum computer, right? And so, so you know what every popular article wants to say is that well, a classical bit has to be either zero or one, but a qubit can be both zero and one at the same time, right? It is you know just like <laughs> just like Schrodinger's cat can be both <laughs> dead and alive, right? At, at once. And uh, but you know now now the the trouble is well, what does it mean? For something to be zero and one at the same time, does it mean that the zero and the one are just like both, you know, being maintained? Like, like you can see them both. Well, no, it clearly it doesn't mean that because when you look, you only see one of them, right? As soon as you measure a qubit, then you force it to make up its mind about what it wants to be, right? And then you know, with some probability, it will collapse to zero. And with some probability, it will collapse to one, right? And and then you know, and then and then that's all you see. You don't see the other possibility. So then, as soon as people understand that, they then they say, oh, so then all a qubit is is it's just some fancy way of saying that you don't know whether the bit is zero or one, right? It's one or the other. You just don't know which. <laughs> so you just say it's in superposition, right? You know, it's just a, a, a pompous way to describe that. And then, you know, you, you look and then you, you know which one it is and that's collapsing the superposition, right? And, <laughs> and, you know, and, and really it's just one or the other, okay? And, and then what you have to explain is that, no, there is, a, there is, a, you know, there is another ontological category that you've missed, right? It's not and, and it's not or either. It is a complex linear combination, okay? It is somehow a sum of the two, right? Uh, uh, of the form like alpha zero plus beta one, where here alpha and beta are going to be complex numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're going to be you know numbers 
that you know like like you know if, if you had ever thought that complex numbers were just something that mathematicians made up to you know to to be perverse or something in the 1500s well guess what we learned with quantum mechanics that complex numbers are there at like at the the deepest level of physical reality that anyone has sure. ever discovered sure. actually maybe may i suggest and, maybe because yeah, uh, yeah. uh well, well, i think we'll, we'll get to, to that and write equations soon enough yeah. i thought maybe okay. uh, i thought you i thought what you're going to talk about actually was this um trying all things in parallel kind of quip oh and, and, right? yeah, yeah, that's yeah why, don't we, why don't we go over yeah. that and then then once we get we'll go to yeah. the nitty-gritty details okay. and, and, and okay. start diving in qubits yeah, mean, yeah 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 no no i yeah. mean i mean so so um so yeah no I mean I I I, I was getting there right okay. but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the the issue is you know if if you um you know what what a superposition means is is it's like uh, it's a vector of these amplitudes mm, right? mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's what we call these complex numbers right you have to assign one of these amplitudes to every possible uh uh, configuration that you could see when you looked at your qubits. And now the key is if you have, let's say, 100 qubits, right, then you need two to the 100 power amplitudes, okay, mm. one for every possible 100 bit string. If mm. you have 1000 qubits, then you need two to the 1000 power amplitudes. Okay, that's already more amplitudes than you could write down in the entire observable universe, right? And you know, so so then you know, so then that 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 is amazing, right? That this, this is a staggering metaphysical claim about the world, okay? But it doesn't mean that you can literally see these two to the thousand numbers, right? You know, somehow these numbers are just going to be involved in calculating the probabilities of the things that you can see, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you look, you're just going to see a single thousand bit string, okay? But now the the crucial point is that you know the the these amplitudes are more than just probabilities right so the amplitude is related to how likely it is that, that you will see this particular string when you look right the the greater the amplitude the greater the probability okay but the amplitudes are not probabilities right and we know that because they can be positive or negative you know or even complex numbers whereas of course a probability is always from 0 to 1 Okay, so you know what would it mean to have a negative thirty percent chance of of uh, uh, of uh, you know someone you know winning the winning in the, in the midterm election or or, uh, 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 for, or 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 whatever it was right that that would be nonsense okay but amplitudes can be these complex numbers uh, and and um, when we don't make a measurement. Then, then these complex numbers evolve by rules that are unfamiliar to everyday experience. They evolve by some linear equation, namely the, the Schrodinger equation, right? And um, and and the, the key in in quantum computation is always that if something could happen uh, one way with let's say a, po uh, 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 a, uh, a positive amplitude and another way with a negative amplitude then you can get two contributions that, as you say, interfere destructively and cancel each other out so that the total amplitude is zero and then that thing doesn't happen at all, right? Whereas, uh, uh, and so with every quantum algorithm, what you're trying to do is sort of choreograph a pattern of interference so that for each wrong answer, each answer you don't wanna see, the different contributions to its amplitude are canceling each other out. They're sort of pointing every which way in the complex plane. Whereas for the right answer, for the answer you do want to see, uh, the amplitudes, uh, the, the contributions to its amplitude are reinforcing each other, right? And this is this is the ability that, that this is the new ability that quantum mechanics gives you, right? So uh, so it's as if you know nature has just provided this absolutely bizarre new hammer you know, like one that no one asked for or imagined would be possible, right? And and then the job of the quantum algorithm designer is to figure out which nails can that hammer hit, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, right, but, but, the, but the hammer is all about interference. If you can't choreograph this pattern of positive and negative amplitudes, then a quantum computer is not going to help you. And you might as well just use a classical computer. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, 
why don't we actually, because you said a lot of things there and I want to unpack what yeah. you said in, in, sure. in writing because that's, that's the, right. the benefit of our podcast. So yeah. why don't, let me, let me kind of write a brief outline of what I think uh, we can uh, talk about. Maybe right. uh, give me, share me your thoughts on that. But I think the first thing we'll do is just set up the, uh, the setup um, in terms of uh, what qubits are and how that differs mm -hmm. from classical bits, for yeah, example, sure. right? Sure. And then the second thing, uh, just to really get concrete, because you said a lot of things there, but I think what we really want to do yeah. is dive deep into a particular right. example to see how it works. So yeah. the kind of 101 example of how you get quantum computing magic, so to speak, yeah. is this Deutsch. Oh, you want the Yosha, Deutsch? Okay. Yeah, Yosha yeah. uh, algorithm. I mean, I think it's yeah. the simplest one, right? I mean, the other ones are a yeah. little bit more involved. This this was the historically right. also the first one, right? Yeah. And I think it, it was, yeah. yeah, and it already illustrates all essentially the the essential concepts uh, already in this example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is where we'll see kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, quantum uh, magic, so to speak, or where 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 you start yeah. diverging from classical computation, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think from there, probably one thing we could mention is, is sort of the uh, complexity classes, because I think that's where mm -hmm. uh, sure. things really, I'd say, uh, this is where you can really disentangle sort of the hype by saying this is what quantum computers yeah. can or cannot do and versus sure. classical computers, right? And then time yeah. permitting, maybe a few remarks about quantum supremacy, because that's also uh, yeah. been sort of a, a landmark result. And uh, yeah, of course, sure. you have a lot to say about that. So I think that that okay. how does that look like as an outline? Sure, looks fine to me. Okay, great. All right. So okay. let's do it. Shall we start with what is a qubit then? Yeah, exactly. Let's do that. What's, right, what's sure. a qubit, let's Scott? So, so, so like I just said, a, a qubit is a bit that can be in a complex linear combination of the zero state and the one state. Okay, so now what do we mean by that, right? Well, okay, so, so if we start with just a classical bit, right, it can be either zero or one, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, if I have n bits, then, uh, well, now I have two to the n possibilities. Right, so I could say that I have a string x, which is an element of the set zero comma one to the n, like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, the next thing we could have is a probability distribution over strings. Right. So if I have a bit and I don't know whether it's a zero or a one, well then I, I I'm going to give it some probability of being zero, right, and some probability of being one. These two probabilities, they should be real numbers. So let's say uh, um, uh, they should be between zero and one and they should add up to one, okay? So uh, so now I could say that my, my knowledge of the bit is described by a two-dimensional vector, right? Of, uh, of, 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 of real numbers adding up to one, okay? And then uh, the, the one other thing to say is what would happen if something were done to the bit? So for example, um, you know, if without looking at this bit, I apply a not gate to it, right? Which flips zero and one. Or, you know, imagine that I flip the coin and then without looking to see whether it's heads or tails, I now flip it over, right? What does that do to this vector? Well, it just acts on it by some linear transformation, okay? So, um, you know, in, in this case, it's just a linear transformation, zero, one, one, zero, okay? So, so I can apply a linear transformation that will, you know, uh, uh, change this vector. Okay, well, what, uh, why is it linear? Well, intuitively, because sort of it, it really is in one of the states, Right. And whichever state it is in, you know, that will, should determine the probability distribution over the next state that it could be in. Right. And it's merely that I don't know, you know, which state it's in. Right. And, and, and uh, if you think about it, then that kind of means that the transformation of the vector of probability should be linear. OK, so. Um, uh, now, uh, uh, you know, the, the, I, I guess the, the, the one other thing to say is, well, what happens if I've got multiple bits? Okay, so for example, I could have two bits. Um, let's say one of them is, is a, a, um, let's say a one with probability P and uh, um, zero with probability one minus P. 
And uh, 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 my second bit will be one with probability Q and uh, zero with probability one minus Q. Okay, right? so just to, just to clarify, so are you um, kind of motivating the, the transition from classical bits to quantum bits right now, or yeah. are you, uh, okay, is it, is it, okay, yeah, okay, okay, great. Just, just want to clarify, okay. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. So, okay, right, so, 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 so now uh, what I can do is I can say, you know, I now have a two-bit state, okay? And that state can be written as what we would call a tensor product mm -hmm. of these, of these two, uh, um, two vectors of length two, and I and and I draw it like that. This, you know, uh, uh, that's the tensor product symbol, and uh, now I get a vector of length four, uh, mm -hmm. which has an entry for each possible two bit string. So mm -hmm. I could say both bits are zero with probability one minus p times one minus q, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get like a uh, one minus p times q for the probability that the first bit is zero and the second bit is one. And then I get a P times one minus Q for the probability that the uh, first bit is one and the second is zero. And then P times Q for both bits to be one. Sure, okay. maybe just, just one clarifying remark, just, just to keep this pa uh, yeah. pedagogical. The you, you mentioned this tensor product. Let me just say very quickly what it is. So, so we right. have a tensor product. Mm -hmm. Right. And just to be concrete, because we're working, we're going to work with complex vector spaces. But if yeah. I have the tensor product of, say, two vector spaces, uh, CN and CM, mm -hmm. then this will just be uh, uh, written as CN tensor CM. And it's also a complex vector space of dimension n times m. So it's going to be yes. isomorphic to C to the n times m. And you could sort of think of it as sort of uh, multiply the basis vectors, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So every basis vector. Just like I did here. Of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Every basis yeah. vector of CN and every basis vector of CM multiply or tensor to give you a basis vector of C to the N times M. And that's exactly what you did there. You had, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these are kind of the zero one so called computational basis. And, mm -hmm. and as you wrote here, there's zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, all the, all the possible mm -hmm. combinations. Okay. Just that's wanted to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank yeah, you. Get, yeah. That, that is, out. that is the much more professional way to say what <laughs> little, little example. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right. Okay. So now, now, now I guess the, the, uh, the, the one interesting thing that we can uh, observe here for the, for the future is that we could also have a probability distribution over two bit strings where I do something like this. I say with half probability, both of my bits are zero and with half probability, both of my bits are one. Okay. And you know, there is no chance that they are different. Okay. And now this is a distribution over two bit strings which cannot be factorized mm. as a tensor product. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so there is no, you know, you can if you just think about it, uh, you see that there is no p and q for which this equation is satisfied. Right. Oh, oh, yeah. Actually, this is a good point to clarify because because uh, the tensor product of c n and c m are mm -hmm all linear combinations, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Of let's say U tensor V where U is in mm -hmm. the first vector space, V is mm -hmm. in the second. And what you're saying is that this state you wrote here is not a, is not a simple tensor. It's in other words, it's not, this mm -hmm. cannot be equal to some fixed U and fixed V, but rather it has to be a linear combination of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so, or another way to say it is that what I've done is I've just correlated the two bits. Yeah. Okay. Actually, this what's the, what's the correct name? Is it simple or product? I think products, product state maybe, or what uh, do you call well, it? Well, I, I mean, I, I would just call this a correlated probability distribution. I see. Okay. I wasn't so, sure what the linear algebra term off the top of my head is. I guess I'll no. look it up later. Okay. Yeah, okay. Or, 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 yeah, or I, I would just call it a, 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 uh, uh, I think a product a, state maybe. It, yeah. it, it, it is a vector in the tensor product space. Yeah that is not itself a tensor product, okay? Mm. okay. So- yeah. um, I'll call it product state, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, 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 this, the, this, is, this is right. The, the, yeah. the, this state is not a product state. Yeah. And learning about one of the bits can tell you something about the other. Okay, if I looked at one of the bits and I saw that it was one, 
immediately I would know that the other one is also one, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how far apart they are. One could be on Earth, the other one could be on Mars, right? And, and often people will talk about that as the signature of quantum entanglement, okay? It's not, okay? Right, so far we've said nothing about quantum mechanics, right? This is a purely classical phenomenon that, you know, if I, if you, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, if you take a pair of matching socks, this was John Bell's example, right? And you put one on earth and the other one on Mars and you look, and you then look at one to see that it's red, then, you, you know, immediately, you know, that the other sock is also red. <laughs> sure, right? sure. But no one, no one, no one, no one calls that spooky action at a distance. I wanted to make clear, like all of the, the picture, you know, all, all of the elements of the quantum picture that, you know, sometimes people go on and on about as special to quantum mechanics and none of them are, right? Mm. These are all things that we can just see and, and we just have seen as features of classical probability theory. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now what is new with quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. right? What right. is the crucial change that we're going to make? Okay. And that change is going to be that we're going to upgrade the components of our vector from probabilities to amplitudes. Mm -hmm. Amplitudes can be complex numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, right. So it's also, it was already implicit the fact that, yeah, it was already implicit that these, these were complex vector spaces. So, I'll, but I'll emphasize it complex linear combination yeah. it's, it's that complex linear combination that you that that's key to what you just what you yeah just said. yeah yeah that's right that's right. right this is this is this is what's going to distinguish quantum mechanics from just conventional probability theory right mm -hmm. from just Correct. saying that you know yeah. the thing is in one state or the other and you just don't know which right okay? right okay but now um imagine that i have a i, I again want to have a vector with uh, with two components which you know I'll call alpha and beta. You know, I guess we'll we'll use Greek letters to make it a little bit fancier, right? And um, uh, so 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 the, so uh, so this is a complex vector. Um, now uh, uh, we could ask, what should be the analog of you know the the uh, uh, the the probabilities adding up to one, right? And we could say, well, maybe it's that it should be a unit vector, right? So, uh, so okay, but when I have complex numbers, you know, the meaning of a uh, of having a unit vector, a vector of length one, becomes a little bit different, you know, from the Pythagorean theorem. It's just that the uh, the sum of the square should be one or since these are complex numbers, actually the squared absolute values, okay? So, so this is what it means to have a, a unit vector of complex numbers, okay? Uh, that the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the two components should be one, okay? And, um, and, and, and in some sense, this is what we mean by a qubit. We mean, you know, a unit vector in C squared. Okay? <laughs> yeah, and just to That's make this clear, we, right? Yeah. C2, we think of as the span uh, mm -hmm. of the zero basis vector and yeah. the one basis vector. We haven't yet, you know, yeah. said anything about cat notation, you know, actually yeah. for computer scientists who are learning the subject, like that is like the single biggest hurdle for them. Oh, really? Right? Okay. Like, yeah, like, 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 you know, linear algebra, they know, right. But then, you know, this, this weird notation for vectors, like, where does that come from? Sure. Do you want right? to say about, or do, do you want to use yeah, cat notation? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me, let me just say, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. To. So what we do is we just um, give these nice little names to uh, the uh, basis vectors, you know, uh, of, our, of our vector space. So like mm -hmm. the zero vector, like, you know, like the, the bit having the value zero, right? We just, um, um, we write it like this. Um, the bit having the value one, which is a, a vector that's orthogonal to that. Okay, we, we write like this. And these asymmetrical brackets, these are, you know, these, these are what are called cats. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a notation introduced by, by Paul Dirac, okay, in 1930. Uh, and that, you know, physicists still uh, use to this day. Okay, and, and the nice thing about it is that, that then, you know, you have these very nice labels for your basis vectors, and then you can just write 
other vectors as just linear combinations of those basis vectors without having to write some gigantic number of, of zeros, you know, <laughs> to, to, to fill out your, your, because we will be dealing with quite enormous vectors, right? Yeah. So, so, so for, for example, let's just, just think about the possible, uh, um, 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 values of a qubit where both of the amplitudes are real. Sure. Maybe just while, while we're on this uh, ket thing, right. it's, it's a, for people who don't know, ket is uh, just uh, it's the second syllable of bracket, right? Because yes. you, you deal with inner products and sort of uh, inner products involve two vectors and the ket is sort of like half the bracket. So just maybe just worth worth mentioning. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Right. And, and the other half is called the bra. Exactly. Which is, you know, it, it, these are actually kind of terrible names, but they, I agree. But yeah, okay. It's, it's stuck. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah. The, 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 uh, yeah. So, so, so cats are column vectors and the corresponding row vectors are called bra vectors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. So, so now if, if, if I just say that both amplitudes have to be real, then my normalization e equation simplifies to alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. This of course is just the equation of the unit circle. I guess with, with some norm, I guess with the, with norms there. Yeah. Right. Um, no, no, I, I said, I said, if they're real. Oh, oh if real. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. What, that's okay. what I just said. Right. Okay. Okay. You know, in, 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 in order to be able to draw this in two dimensions. Sure. Sure. Okay. Right? It is, Fair. it is convenient function that they are real. And then, and then, um, and then I just get a circle. Okay. okay. And so now, yeah. uh, um, what I see is that, is that the horizontal direction, is uh is the zero qubit the mm -hmm. vertical direction is the one qubit but mm -hmm. now i also have all of the other points on the circle so for example i have this one here which is zero plus one over the square root of two mm -hmm. okay an equal superposition of the zero and one state this is important enough that we give it its own name we call it the plus state okay it's just mm. a cat ket plus mm. okay mm -hmm. and there's also another superposition of zero and one which is orthogonal to plus um will be not surprisingly uh we call it minus okay the minus state and what is this it is um ket zero minus ket one over the square root of two okay uh, you know, and, and I could have any other possibility. Like I could have a, uh, a state here, which is mostly zero, but with a little bit of one mixed in, right? And now, um, you know, now now the, the, the you know, there are sort of two, so, so the, these are what my states look like, right? And, um, and okay, so, so, so um, um, now th there, there are two, given these states, there are two main things that I can do with them. Okay, the first is that I can make a measurement. So I can look at a qubit and ask it whether, let's say it is zero or one, okay? And, um, and the rule for what happens if I do that is that the probability that I see the outcome one is just equal to the squared absolute value of the amplitude for, for the outcome one, okay? And we could say, If I have a, a vector of n amplitudes and I now measure it in the standard basis, so like to ask it, like, which one are you? Are you one, two, three, up to n? Then it tells me that it is the ith one with probability equal to the squared absolute value of the ith amplitude. Okay. But in addition to that, the entire vector collapses to just the ith basis vector, okay? Mm -hmm. So basically after it decide, after nature decides that it wants the answer to be i, then it just, you know, it makes the vector i, it, it sure. sticks with the Let, Let's pause there because this is, this is really kind of also one of the spooky things about quantum mechanics. And in some sense, uh, well, I, I don't know if controversial is the right word, but there are there are various interpretations of quantum mechanics. Yes. And this is, I guess, the, the default one, so to speak, the one you learn in in, in, in university yeah, courses, well, at well, least. Well, yeah. Right, right, right. At this yeah. point, I'm not making any statement about interpretation. I'm just saying this is how quantum mechanics gets used. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair yeah, enough. Yeah, sorry. Yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is what's called the uh, Co Copen... Hagen yeah, yeah. I'm interpretation not, I'm not, wave. I'm not committing, I am not committing okay. myself to the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, I see. 
right? I, you know, regardless of whether there is something deeper underlying this, like this is how you use ah, it. Sorry, I, I, <laughs> yes, uh, what, yes. what, I, what I wanted to, have, okay. So, yeah. Well, okay, actually, let me, let me push back a little bit because, because you did <laughs> yes. say, you did yes. use the word collapse and that's sort of the, the, one of the key words for the Copenhagen interpretation as opposed to say many worlds or whatnot, right? So that, I mean, that's a whole, I don't want to go down that, that, that rabbit hole, but I just wanted to emphasize that, that that's part of that package, right. I suppose. Is that right? Uh, I mean, I mean, Copenhagen would say that, that, you know, collapse is then, you know, the, just, just a fundamental part of the picture and is not to be explained by anything deeper. Right. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is just, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, it, you know, because, because, because all, 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 or you shouldn't even ask for anything deeper because, you know, all, all that you have the right to ask for from physics is that it account for your observations. You know, the many worlders or the Avredians would say that, no, you too have a quantum state. You know, you are part of, in fact, the global quantum state of the whole universe. And this whole process of measurement and collapse is just to be explained as a side effect of you becoming entangled with the system that you are measuring, right? So, so that that is the difference between you know the Copenhagenists and the many worlders. They both, you know, if they're actually in the lab, they're both going to completely agree about doing exactly the thing that sure. I just said. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I think unfurling that will take us way aside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I yeah, just yeah. wanted to. No, yeah, I mean we yeah, we okay. could spend the entire time just talking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. about that debate. But yeah, but... yeah, yeah, sure. But okay. <laughs> but but okay. But but yeah. yeah the point yeah, is, yeah. For, forget forget the whatever metaphysics that surrounds what's going on here. The, the point is that <laughs> yes. you have yeah. you have a vector. There is a non-unitary operation after you measure it, which is this collapse of the wave function to mm -hmm. sort of the you know the now the Dirac distribution mm -hmm. on the measurement that you observed. That okay. Right? Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean, yeah. Um, it, it's funny how you, you know, your clarifications actually use much fancier words than 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 than, <laughs> than than I was using. But that might actually be like for mathematicians who are listening, like they might understand the fancy words much better than the simple. Oh, I words. see. Well, I, uh, <laughs> well, well, maybe. Well, let's let's hope that our yeah. different yeah, styles yeah. are are constructively interfering and not destructively. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Okay. Right, well, right. I guess okay. listeners will sure, pick. Sure. They, they can pick okay. either you or me to listen to when they when they watch. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. So yep. if all I could do was measure, then you might have just said, well, then then why do the the uh, the, the 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 complex phases even matter at all? Right. Like mm -hmm. I might have I might as well have just talked about the squared absolute values of these amplitudes, you know, the the probabilities, in other words, and just been done with it. Right. But now now we kind of come to uh, the key about quantum mechanics, which is that. I don't have to just measure in one basis, right? I can do a change of basis, okay? And to change, to sort of rotate our state, you know, to sort of change its basis, okay? I can apply, in principle, quantum mechanics says that I can apply any linear transformation that preserves the norm, okay? That maps one unit vector to another unit vector. Okay, and such transformations are called unitary. Okay, yeah. So, so sort of all of the unitary transformations uh, are are uh, you know so so the the transformations with the property that you know the norm of U V equals the norm of V mm -hmm. uh, for all V, right? Mm -hmm. These are the transformations that I am allowed to apply. Okay, so let's just look at some examples uh, for uh, what are the what are some unitary transformations that can act on a single qubit? Okay, well, you know, there's the identity, of course, which just says do absolutely nothing to my qubit. There is the logical not operation, which we already saw. Okay, which says just map one to zero and map zero to one. Okay, but now you know there are some things that have no classical analog such as this one here, which says uh, flip the uh, uh, amplitude, flip the sign of the amplitude if the qubit is one, okay? But if it's zero, then do nothing, okay? So this is called a phase operation. I could even have uh, uh, some complex phases, like, you know, I could say, if the qubit is one, then multiply the amplitude by I, 
Okay. And now I can also do things that will, will rotate between the zero state and the one state. So here is an example. I could do one over the square root of two, one minus one, one, one. Okay. What does this do? If you think about it, this is actually a 45 degree uh, counterclockwise rotation in the plane. Okay. So what this is saying is that if my um, qubit is uh, zero, then I should map it to plus. If it's plus, then I should map it to one. Okay. You know, and if it's one, then I should map it to uh, this thing here, which is minus the minus state. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and then if I do it yet again, then I should map it to minus zero. Okay. Now one uh, very curious feature of quantum mechanics is that uh, the global phase is irrelevant. So if I multiply my entire quantum state vector by a scalar, that has no effect. Mm -hmm. So for example, the zero state and the minus zero state are just two different notations for exactly the same quantum state, right? There is, there's no physical difference between those two, okay? So in some sense, I've gotten back to the zero state just by rotating, okay? But something interesting has happened here because just by taking the zero state and rotating it twice, I have gotten to the one state. Mm. And so it's kind of like I've applied a square root of the not gate, right? Mm -hmm. And that's already something with no classical analog, right? Mm -hmm. There is no operation on a single classical bit where if I apply it twice in succession, then I get the not operation. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I would, yeah. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of, uh, just, just, just to emphasize more what you just yeah. said. Um, right, so it's the overall phase doesn't matter, but of course the, the key magic are relative phases, right? So, so exactly. you know, what, you know uh, zero and minus zero, there's no distinction, but you know, one plus zero and one minus zero, th those are different. Oh. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that. Yes. Yeah. And and I guess the and, and, and you can already see it from the picture. I mean, the magic behind the in, in the quantum world, there's more room to move, right? Because <laughs> bits are just discrete things. You could basically only permute things. It's rigid. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. in, in in quantum physics, you have a continuous space of transformations. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So yeah. So 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 it it is sort of this this beautiful way of sort of enlarging this discrete space, you know, zero, right. one to the N to this whole continuum, right? right. Of all of the unit vectors. And, and so, so now just to, to um, emphasize the, the point, okay, now, now, now the key to, uh, or a key to, to quantum computation is going to be that, that when I have multiple qubits, right? Then, then um, how does this picture change? Well, well, you know, a single, qubit was just a unit vector in C squared, okay? If I have two qubits, that's going to be a unit vector in the tensor product space, C mm -hmm. squared times C squared, which is isomorphic to C to the fourth, right? Mm -hmm. And now if I had a thousand qubits, then that's going to be a unit vector in C squared tensored with itself a thousand times. Okay, which is isomorphic to C to the two to the 1000. Okay, so, so already with a thousand qubits, I now have a two to the 1000 dimensional vector space. Okay, and we can understand that very, very concretely. It's just saying that if I have a thousand qubits, then my state, you know, and often we use the Greek letter psi to denote some arbitrary. Uh, quantum state, some, you know, arbitrary superposition state. Um, I now have to write it like this. I have to write for every possible thousand bit string X, what is the amplitude for that X? Okay. So, so I have, so, so you can see that just to specify the state of a thousand qubits, right? I may in general need two to the thousand complex numbers. Yeah, let me interject here because I think yeah. there's something very interesting. Is this where the distinction between hardware and and uh, classical storage of bits really uh, makes a distinction? Because for example, like I, I, at a high level, even something like the number pi, right? If you yes. want to store all the digits of pi, you couldn't do it. It would it, it would exhaust any any uh, uh, computer. But yet. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I don't know, to the extent that there's a physical object in the world that is of length pi or whatever real number or whatever. Like, in other words, the, the um, things that exist out there kind of can, can contain unbounded information merely by them well, existing in some sense, right? So, well, you know, the, 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 this becomes very tricky because it depends what you mean. Can you actually see the information when you look? Right. Mm -hmm. Like I could say that, that I could encode pi in just a single coin by just, let's say, make, making a coin that is heads with probability one over pi and, and tails the rest of the time. Right. <laughs> OK. But then, you know, even supposing that I knew how to do that, do it exactly, which, you know, mm -hmm. of course, in real life, it's never going to be exact. Right. Mm -hmm. But even supposing I could do it exactly like it would be of limited use you might say, because then all I get to do is look at the coin, see whether it's heads or tails. Mm. And that might give me this extremely crude approximation as mm -hmm. to whether, you know, pi is likely or to be large or small or something, right? Mm -hmm. But but I can't just look at the coin in order to read off the digits. Mm -hmm. Amplitudes are going to be subject to that same limitation. I okay? see. That in some sense, they are there in the mm -hmm. physical description of the system. You know, we need them there because we need them to calculate the probabilities of the things that we can see. And yet we can never directly see the amplitudes, mm -hmm. right? The amplitudes are, are just, are only used to calculate the probabilities of the things that we can see. And so even though the amplitudes form a continuum, uh, uh, you know, it, like we would not really say that we can usefully store infinite information into them mm -hmm. because as soon as you look, well, you don't see the amplitude. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I, th I think this is where I was trying to get because it's like, yeah, you know, you you can make a th whatever a thousand, you know, yeah. a, a thousand qubits in the lab, right? That's that's mm -hmm. just a matter of of making a, being able to make a qubit and making a thousand yes. of them, right? Yes. And 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 that that's what I meant in the sense of like hardware versus storing information. Somehow the qubits kind of contain all. Well, I guess contain is in quotes, I guess is the point you're trying to make, contains all this yeah. information. And, and somehow yeah. it's it's a little bit tricky to kind of think about it in terms of storing it all on a on, in a classical right. way, right? Right, yeah. right. But but now, you know, ev even after we've sort of understood that point about, you know, that that, that, that you don't get to see the amplitudes and, and, and you know, you don't, you know, if, if I stored the complete works of Shakespeare <laughs> or all the digits of pi in, in, in the binary expansion of some amplitude, I couldn't then read it out afterwards right even after you know all that like there's still something going on here with this entangled state of a thousand qubits which is that even just to represent this state approximately right forget about exactly now mm -hmm. okay even just to approximate it to any reasonable precision you would already need something like two to the thousand bits of information mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So assuming not, it's not, a, not, yeah. not infinite, not infinitely many, right. but exponentially more than you might have thought. Right. right. Assuming, assuming it's not a product state, because if it were a product state, right. then you would, then you would That's just. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 but in yeah. general, it doesn't have to be a product state. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. okay. So may, maybe, maybe we should come back to this point. Yeah, okay. Because, yeah. because now, um, you know, how do you create the, these kinds of forms? Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I talked about operation, unitary operations that act on only one qubit. Right. Mm -hmm. But we are not restricted to only those. OK, so like I could have two particles that, you know, each one would store a, a qubit and let's say it, it's spin state or something like that. OK, but these, you know, nature has interactions between particles. Right. If I bring two particles close to one another, then, you know, some unitary operation could act that, that couples the two particles together. OK. Mm -hmm. And so so let me give an example of that. Okay, so 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 now we're going to talk. We're talking about a unitary operation that acts on C two tensor C two, right? So it so it better be a four by four unitary, okay? And we can have such unitaries, which are which are not just tensor products of one qubit unitaries, uh, but which actually couple the two together. So here is maybe the simplest example. This uh, in quantum computing, we call the controlled knot or the C knot operation, okay? And if you think about it, uh, what it is doing is it's saying the string zero, zero should be mapped to itself. You know, I mean, you know, I can think of what it's doing, you know, it, it's just permuting the basis mm -hmm. states, right? It's a permutation matrix. 
the string zero one should be mapped to itself. But now the string one zero should be mapped to one one and one one should be mapped to one zero. Okay, mm -hmm. so basically it's saying if the first bit is zero, then do nothing. But if the first bit is one, then flip the second bit. Mm -hmm. okay? So so in that way, it is coupling the two bits, right? It's saying act on the second bit in a way that depends on the value of the first. Exactly. Bit. Another way of writing it in a, in a succinct formula would be uh, X, uh, Y yes. goes to X and then Y plus X. Yes. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, you know, in quantum computing, we like to use this notation of quantum circuits. Uh, actually, David Deutsch, who's the co-founder of quantum computing, hates this term circuits because, you know, they're not actually loops, right? Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're not closed loops, but, but they are, they're, they're sort of a, by a quantum mm -hmm. circuit, we mean a sort of list of what simple unitaries you want to apply to your qubits in which order. So it I almost look so 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 mm -hmm. they so when you draw them they almost look like a musical score. Okay? Yeah, but is so it, we, but you know we we do have circuit boards that aren't. I'm just wondering in what sense a circuit yeah, has to yeah. be a loop. I don't I don't know. Okay. Yeah Anyways. yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. You you could call them you know networks or something okay. like that. Okay. But we we um well I, I'm fine to call them circuits. Okay. Uh, uh so 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 what we do is we um we sort of uh, um uh, uh list the qubits from top to bottom you know, with their initial states. Like, so here I'm saying, I want two qubits that both start in the zero state, which is like the traditional initial state for a qubit to have. Um, and then I can say, I, now I want to Hadamard the first qubit, okay? So I'm going to draw that like this. Uh, um, so so oh, I should say, what what is the Hadamard gate? This is a, a very, very um, important one qubit gate. Uh, which is just this two by two matrix here, okay? And the Hadamard gate has the very important property that its square is the identity, <laughs> okay? So it's a little bit like that 45 degree rotation that I had before, except, you know, the minus one is now in a different place, okay? So it's actually a rotation composed with a reflection, <laughs> okay? That's what the Hadamard is. And you can think of Hadamard as just the gate that switches you between two different orthogonal bases, the zero and one basis and the plus and minus basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So like Hadamard of zero is plus and Hadamard of one is minus. Mm -hmm. right. And the reverse is also true. Hadamard of plus is zero, Hadamard of minus is one. Okay, so so now you know you so so you'll often you'll very often see a Hadamard gate on these quantum circuits, uh, so so that would look like this, and so so now I've said my first qubit is now in an equal superposition of the zero state and the one state, mm -hmm. right? So it looks like this, right? Because okay. that's the, that's the plus state. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's the plus state, right? Uh, um. And now that is still in tensor product with my second qubit, which remains in the state zero because I haven't done anything to it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. But now I can use a C naught to couple the two qubits. Mm -hmm. So let me draw a C naught. Okay. C naught looks like that. Uh, so, so, so we, we call, you know, the top qubit, the control qubit, mm -hmm. and the bottom one is the target qubit. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And now C naught, remember it says, if the first qubit is one, then flip the second qubit and otherwise do nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's see what that does. I've got, I had zero plus one over square root of two tensor with zero. Okay. Now that is just the same thing as zero, zero plus one, zero. Mm -hmm. over square root of two, right? Mm -hmm. I can, you know, take the tensor and, and I can distribute it, you know, among right. the zeros. Of course, and the yes, right? that's right, right. Okay, and, 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 and by the way, like when, if I write something like zero, zero, all I mean, that's just a shorthand for zero tensor zero. Yes, yes, we've been right? using that shorthand implicitly for a while now. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, um, okay, but now I do a C naught 
Okay, now everything in quantum mechanics is, is well, you know, other than with the possible exception of measurement, right? All mm -hmm. of the unitary transformations are linear. Okay, since they are linear, I can think about what they do by just thinking of each basis state independently, right? So what does a C naught do to this basis state zero, zero? Well, it just maps it to itself, the zero, zero, okay? But what does it do to one, zero? Well, now it's gonna flip the second bit. It's gonna make that one, one. So when I do the C naught, I get zero, zero plus one, one over square root of two. Mm -hmm. And now I have an entangled state. Okay. So, so this shows how starting with two, you know, qubits that were unentangled, both in the zero state, I do a Hadamard and then a C naught, and then I can get an entangled state. I can, I can, I can uh, uh, force the qubits to no longer have separate you know, uh, 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 uh -huh. states. Maybe, let me ask maybe a very naive state. question. You could have also yeah, yeah. made this state by just make, preparing zero, zero, preparing one, one, and just adding them, I suppose. Right. Oh, you want well, to, well, you want yeah, to but, but, okay. but, that, but, but adding them is not a sort of physical thing that I can physically do to my qubits. Oh, right? I see. It's a thing okay. that I can do in the mathematical description of my, my space of states. Right? I see. But then, 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 then there would still be the question, what do I physically do to my qubits, you know, that are in my uh, my magnetic trap or in my soup, soup you know, my uh, dilution refrigerator or whatever, in order to get that linear combination? I see, I see. So I guess the 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 whole point is that circuits are implementable and circuits yeah. are a sequence of unitaries. Is that the point? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yes, that's right. So, so the so a circuit is kind of telling me. What do I physically have to do to my qubits and in what order? I see. In order to get the unitary transformation I mean, that I want. Yeah, I mean, not not uh, not being in the know, it's not, yeah. I say, actually what you said is a puzzling to me because as a mathematician, adding two vectors is the, is the most trivial thing you can do. Yet you say it's physically <laughs> difficult. On the other right, hand, yeah. it sounds like yeah. what you're saying is that an arbitrary unitary yeah. is somehow physically uh, realizable, which is counterintuitive because an arbitrary well, unitary is like a complicated object, right? Well, so. yeah, no, no. So, so, so now everything is going to come down to a question of, well, you know, given a description of the unitary that I might want on n qubits. So the group of unitaries that act on, on n qubits is going to be, um, I guess, u of two to the n, mm -hmm. right? So it's going to be, you know, two, we're talking about two to the n by two to the n matrices, right? Which take like four to the n uh, real parameters to specify, okay? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, so these can be immensely large objects, okay? And now, you know, a first question that you might ask is just for any such unitary, you know, acting on uh, uh, some, you know, let's say n is, I don't know, 100 or 1,000, I, so I have some huge number of qubits, can any such unitary be decomposed into just unitaries that act only on one or two qubits at a time, right? And that are, you know, the the identity on on all of the other qubits. Mm -hmm. So 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 can I sort of take any n qubit unitary and realize it by you know one of these these musical scores, you know, mm -hmm. by these you know, right. uh, these quantum circuits? Now that turns the answer turns out to be yes. You know that is a theorem that one one needs to prove, right? Uh, it, it was proved in the in the early to mid nineteen nineties. Is there okay. a name for the theorem? Um, I think it's just like like universality of various sets of quantum. Okay, okay. 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 We would just call this universality. Okay. So so it was what was proven was that various sets of one and two qubit gates you know uh, have the you know in fact even if I just took let's say the C naught gate plus the set of all possible one qubit gates, mm -hmm. okay? This already has this property of universality, okay? Uh -huh. Which means that by composing enough of those things, I could get any unitary I want uh -huh. on any number of qubits. And, and is there a bound on the length uh -huh. of that circuit? Excellent, okay. excellent. Because now, right, good, because now, you know, you might say, Are, aren't we done? Haven't we just solved <laughs> right. quantum computing theory? Well, the reason why we haven't is that in general, the number of, of one and two qubit gates that you would need 
uh, is going to grow like four to the end power. <laughs> okay. okay? Right. So, you know, if, if N is a hundred, right, this could already be astronomical, right? If N is a thousand, like more than the number of subatomic particles in the, in the known universe. Okay. So, uh, and, and, and we can see that this has to be true in a way, right? And the way that we can see that it has to be true is just by accounting. Like we can say, how many parameters does it take to specify? Yeah, fair uh, enough. That's right. That's right. In, 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 in n qubit unitary, right? We need four to the n parameters even just to specify such an object, right? Right. And so then, you know, the the uh, um, if if I have you know much fewer than that number of gates, then then you know just even if I vary those gates however I like, I will generate a manifold whose dimension is just too small. Right. to encompass the full unitary group, right? Mm -hmm. And so just by counting dimensions, I can see that four to the n must be necessary. Sure. Okay. Okay. But now this still, you know, that, that was, that's kind of an abstract argument and it doesn't, it tells me nothing about how many gates would I need to implement some specific unitary that I might care about. Right. And so now we come to like the whole subject matter of quantum algorithms and quantum complexity theory. Right. Which is all about, well, how many gates do you need to do some particular unitary that will, you know, produce some interesting behavior that will help you solve some computational problem that you would like to solve. Right. And so now mm -hmm. what we always want in quantum computing theory is uh, we would we want um, um, to apply unitaries uh, where um, that 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 I that I can compose using only a using a number of gates that is only polynomial in the number of qubits, right? Mm -hmm. So I want the complexity of my uh, unitary to grow only like the number of qubits raised to some fixed power. What did you write here? I couldn't tell. Uh, I wrote N, N to the O of one power. Ah, okay, okay. So, okay. Or, you know, N to the C power, okay? So given any N qubit unitary, I can define the complexity of that unitary to just be the minimum number of gates that you might uh. need, you know, in any circuit that produces that unitary, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then what we've just said is that for most U's, C of U will grow like four to the N. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's take, let's take a back a uh, step back right. here because um, this is kind of like a general question about uh, the complexity of algorithms. Yeah. Distinction of building your own handcraft algorithm uh, from the get go, like Deutsch, jo Yosha, and and Grover's, yep. etc. Right. They just, they, I just uh -huh. think they're they're two different. Uh, uh, Ways of thinking yeah. about it? I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, okay. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, also, you know, if you're, you know, building a, a concrete algorithm, right? The mm -hmm. first question that people will have for you is, well, how many gates do you need sure. to implement that algorithm, sure. right? The reason why Shor's algorithm was a breakthrough, right, was that, you know, it solves the problem of factoring an n digit number. But you know the number of gates that you need to do that is not exponential in n. Okay. Oh sure. It is only it is only quadratic in n. Yeah. I, I guess what I was trying to get at was uh, I, maybe I wasn't clear enough. In in yeah. practice, do people um, come up with the unit some some unitary and then try to look at the ex how how minimal you can express it, or did they come up with the clever circuit to begin with? And then it, it, the value of that circuit would, was in the fact that it was short to begin with. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's, that, that's a fair question. People do, people do it both ways. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Got it. So, yeah, got either it. way. I mean, I mean, in that we can talk about the case of Shor's factoring algorithm, since that's the most famous quantum okay. algorithm of all, right? You know, in that case, Shor first knew that he wanted a certain unitary operation, what we now call the QFT the mm. quantum Fourier transform, right? He then said, now I have the technical problem. How do I produce a small circuit that Got will it. Us okay. to that UFT? Got it. And he then was able to solve that problem. Okay, that makes right. a lot of sense now. Yeah, yeah. good. Okay, good. okay, great, great, great. Yeah, because okay. I was thinking of Deutsch Yosha, and it was like, okay, you just write the circuit, okay. But well, okay, yeah, so right. Yeah. So, okay. so the yeah. issue is, you know, you said that Deutsch Josa, you know, had had like all the main ideas, and you know, like there's 
the 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 issue is like there there were several years where people knew about Deutsch Josa and they were just not impressed, right? Okay. Because, yeah, so De Deutsch Josa, you know, was like the first quantum algorithm that we uh, ever saw that got, got a you know that, that was not about simulating quantum mechanics itself, mm. right? And that was able to get a clear speed up for something like for some classical task, uh, but the speed up was just not an impressive one. So uh, it was, you know, it, it was it was more more of theoretical than of practical interest. Maybe maybe there's just slightly slightly more to say because uh, uh, um, so 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 the the name of the game in quantum algorithms is going to be that uh, you know I have some problem that I want to solve, like you know find the prime factors of this number or or you know or, or whatever it is. And now in order to help me solve that problem, I can um, initialize a whole bunch of qubits into let's say the zero state. Then I can act on them via some network of, you know, or some circuit of a one and two qubit gates, such as Hadamard and C0 and, and various other gates. Um, Hadamard and C0 by themselves actually will not be enough, uh, which is a, an interesting fact. But, you know, I can have, as soon as I throw in a few more one qubit gates, then I can get a universal set or, or, or at least an approximately universal set, which is good enough in practice. Okay. And, um, and then at the very end, I have to measure my qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these little speedometers, this is how <laughs> we would denote the measurements in a quantum circuit. Okay. And, and these sort of force the qubit to be, you know, to randomly collapse to either zero or one. And then we, we read out what's the outcome, okay? According to that rule I said before, that the probability of some outcome equals the squared absolute value of its amplitude. Right, and okay. the key here is that measurement uh, kind of, you can do it um, component-wise. That's exactly what you're doing here. Right? Yeah, 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 that's right. I can, I can yeah. also, I haven't really gone into this, but I could also choose to measure some of the qubits and not measure others. Sure, that's right. Okay? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. turns out to like, in a certain technical sense, not be needed, right? I could always, without loss of generality, uh, defer the measurements to the end, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if, if I want to, okay? Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, often in practice, the way we think about quantum algorithms, we will imagine measuring some qubits even at intermediate stages, mm -hmm. okay? And certainly if I wanna error correct my qubits, then in practice, I will be measuring. It yeah, easy. actually, maybe the, uh, just to clarify, yeah. uh, when yeah. you measure, I guess, because we had this discussion about what's like physically realizable, I guess, are you always yeah. going to measure with respect to some relatively simple basis? Because, uh, which, uh, yes, right? yes, good. Right. So, so here I was just imagining that I could just pick some individual qubit mm -hmm. and measure it in the basis zero comma one. Right, right. Okay, mm -hmm. right. And now, and like, if I just write, uh, this, this, if I just draw this measurement symbol and don't say anything else, then that is what it means. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if I had wanted to measure in the basis plus and minus, then I could have easily done that as well. I mm -hmm. mean, for one thing, I could have just first applied the Hadamard gate mm -hmm. and then measured in the standard basis. Sure. Right. That'll have exactly the same effect as measuring in the Hadamard basis. Mm -hmm. Hey, I could also just, you know, invent a new symbol for it, like, uh, uh, you know, measure in the Hadamard basis or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, I can't just write down some enormous unitary on thousands of qubits and just plunk it into my circuit. Like, oh, now I'm going to apply that. Right. Like the engineer is going to come back to me and say, how do I actually realize that? Right. And by realize it, they mean using simple operations on only one or two qubits at a time. Yeah. 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 I realized actually, I, uh, this is actually now obvious in hindsight because, you know, with all these things, just like a, a, a unitary can act on the bra or the cat, you, of course, you can't have an arbitrarily complicated bra vector because you could just shove the unitary in there. Right. So it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, that's basically the, the point. Yeah. So, yeah. so your yeah. your bra had better be a, a simple vector as well. Otherwise, you could just sh smuggle your unitary into there. Yes. Basically. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. So we right. so we have yeah. So we kind of have we have rules against smuggling complexity into, <laughs> yes. into, yeah. into, in, 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 into your definitions. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because because then you know ultimately when you have to build the actual device, then you yes. know you you will have to implement all the complexity one way or the other. Right. 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 So. Right. Um, 
So good. Uh, okay, so so now, um, you know, what I've just told you about is called the quantum circuit model, right? And this is kind of, you know, a fundamental way that we tend to think about quantum computation. We think of a, a quantum algorithm uh, in some sense um, is a quantum circuit, right? Mm -hmm. That's or, right. Or, 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 or a little bit more precisely than that, it, it, it is just a classical algorithm. So just some piece of code that can run on, a cla on your ordinary classical computer, but which will then output a description of a quantum circuit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, right. So, so like if you actually walk into a quantum computing lab, what you will see is some, stu you know, usually some grad students, you know, sitting at, you know, computers that look, you know, that are running, you know, Windows or Linux or something that are quite ordinary computers, right? But they are hooked up to microcontrollers that then have wires going into a dilution refrigerator or, you know, a, and um, lasers that can control the ions in a, in a trap or something like that. So the classical computer is sending instructions to sort of tell, you know, the, the, these, these, um, devices which gates to apply to the qubits at sure. which time. Uh, maybe the po way to say this, the, the circuit yeah. is basically a classical API. And then there's some yeah. backend that translates that into a quantum implementation, because what you don't want to do, and this yeah. is the whole point, what you yeah. don't want to do yeah. is write out the full unitary as a classical yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. uh, matrix, right? That, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And, and we also don't want to play any tricks where we say, well, you know, even just to, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the quantum circuit that I have in mind is a quantum circuit whose very description encodes the solution to the halting problem or something <laughs> like that. Right. And then you say, okay, great. Well now, you know, the, again, the engineer says, how do I write down that circuit? Right. So what you have to do is you have to give them a classical computer program, you know, mm -hmm. they can run on the classical computer and that will generate the quantum circuit that will sort of generate the instructions to send out to the qubits to say which simple unitaries do you apply to which qubits when. And, and ultimately that is what we mean by a quantum algorithm. So okay. just this last thing you said, because the halting problem of course is famously not, not, not a solvable yes. problem on a classical right. Turing machine, but what, what was this remark you made? Could, could something about quantum computers, are, 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 they, are they able to do something special in this regard? Uh, no, they're not. And I just said the, the definition of what we mean by a quantum algorithm is not allowed to smuggle things in. Oh, like, oh I see what you're you saying. Know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, so this is why we say, you know, you need an, an ordinary computer program that can output descriptions of the quantum circuits, you Got know, it. given, given the input, given how many qubits you want to be, yeah. you know, operating on and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Okay. In other words, like, yeah, a quantum, a quantum computer is still a, a, a Turing machine in some sense, and that you can't have these oracles that just do things, yeah. magic things for you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah. now yeah. I should say this, this was not the original way that people thought about quantum computation, like mm. David Deutsch in the eighties, and then Bernstein and Vazirani in uh, 1993, when they tried to write down theoretical foundations of quantum computing, like their first idea was that you have to take the, in, the whole notion of a Turing machine and make it quantum. Ah, I okay? see. So ah. you have to have a quantum uh, um, tape. You have to have a quantum tape head that can be go in a superposition of moving left and moving right, and that can be entangled with the contents of the tape, and mm -hmm. on and on. Now it tur that turns out to be doable, but tremendously complicated mm -hmm. and, and and nasty mm -hmm. to work out the details of. And what people realized shortly afterward was that the version that I told you where you just have a classical computer that is controlling a quantum circuit mm. that is mathematically equivalent. Oh, wow. Right? And, and it, and it's a hundred times simpler to think about. Yes. Well, that, okay. that's a great, that's a great result. Yeah. Is that, is that, yeah, yeah, some, is, are there some is, names yeah. associated to that? Uh, um, that Andy Yao, who oh, actually okay. won the Turing award, not, okay. not, not for this specifically, but, uh, okay. you know, this was, this was a paper of his in 1993. I okay. Believe. And um, yeah, so people realize that the, th there is this equivalence between the sort of quantum Turing machine and quantum circuit models. And, and the circuit model actually, not only is it simpler to think about, it corresponds more directly to what the experimentalists will sure. actually do. 
which sure. is, you know, use a classical computer for everything that you can yeah. use it for and use the qubits only where they're actually going to help. Yeah. I mean, I guess right? you could say this is one of the, I don't know, rare triumphs of complexity theory where you actually know it's like oh. something's equal to something else. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean we know we know many many results about things being equal to other things. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay. we do we do you know if 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 that's the definition of a triumph, then we have many many triumphs. Oh, okay, okay. Of of, of, of that kind. Okay, okay, okay. Although <laughs> you know, there's still a lot, you know, still tri- a lot tri- more to tri- know. Okay, tri- sure. Triumphs of the kind that look like p not equal to np; those are much rarer. Obviously. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, okay. So, all right. So, 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 Deutsch Joza? Yeah, let's do it. All right. All right. Let's do it. So, um, you know, having defined this whole model of, of quantum circuits, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you get to a concrete problem, we almost never know like what is the smallest quantum circuit for, 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 mm. for that, you know, for that, you, you know, to uh, uh, solve the problem we want or implement the unitary that we want, right? The best we can say is, well, like, here's a circuit and oh, maybe, you know, here's a better circuit, right? But as for what is the best circuit, you know, typically we've got no idea, okay? And, um, you know, this is re- deep, closely related to some of the hardest open problems in all of computer science or, you know, really math for that matter, like the P versus NP problem, right? And, and things like that. We're just not very good at, you know, proving that uh, 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 natural problems require exponentially many operations, even when we strongly suspect that that's the case, okay? But now one thing that people realized very early on is that uh, there is there is one simplifying assumption that you can make um, where where you can get start getting you know immensely uh, sharper answers right about what is and isn't possible you know and this is already true with classical computation but it's even more true with quantum computation okay and uh, and so the thing that you do is that you switch attention to um, a model that is called query complexity. And it's also, it goes under other names. It's also called the black box or the Oracle model. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, these all mean the same thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Uh, but what they mean is that we're going to have some kind of subroutine that computes some function. Okay. So um, like this. Okay, and uh, uh, the resource that we're going to care about is how many calls to that subroutine do we have to make, right? In order to learn some property of the function that it's computing, right? And uh, 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 and the only way we get to learn about the function is to call this subroutine, okay? So we do not get to look inside of it. We don't get to look at its code. And, you know, so th- that's why it's called black box, right? <laughs> it is, you know, like literally a, a black box. Okay, now uh, in, you know, now now often th- this does model how we think about algorithms, right? Like uh, um, you say, like, like if you're trying to, you know, do optimization, right? Like you're trying to find the minimum of some cost function, right? And then often the way that you'll think about that is just that, well, given any solution, you can evaluate what it's, you know, what is its cost. And now you want to kind of move around in the space of solutions to find a solution that has the lowest cost, right? But as you do this, you're just going to be treating the cost function itself as a black box. You're not going to be looking inside of it, right? And, and in that setting, uh, very often we can actually prove things about like what is the best possible algorithm that you could have. Right? Maybe the like analogy you, would be like if you do gradient descent in machine learning, right? Like I don't yeah. need to know what the definition of the function is. I just need to call, you know, dot grad basically. And that's yeah. it. Yeah, right? that's right. That's right. That, so, so gradient descent, that would be an excellent example of an algorithm that does use only black box access to your, <laughs> to your function. Right. And, um, you know, and, and so then if, if, if we can show that a problem is easy, even in the black box setting, then voila, we have a useful algorithm, right? Whenever someone provides that black box, 
then we just, you know, we, we just uh, uh, um, combine it with what we did and, and get, get our algorithm, right? So now what does, what does the, this black box model look like in the world of quantum computing, right? Well, now the new twist in quantum computing is that, you know, since everything is, you know, quantum can be in superposition, we also get to call our black box, our subroutine on a superposition of inputs. Okay, and get a superposition of outputs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this yeah, this, I, yeah. this 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 is going to be the big new twist. Yes, yeah, I have okay. to say I don't know if I'm jumping ahead a yeah. bit, but I know yeah, I've yeah. I've looked at Deutsch Joshi se several yeah. times, and I yeah. find that to be the biggest. I don't know what to right to call it, leap of leap of. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there, you know, there, is a, boost. there is a conceptual yeah. leap here, right? Yeah. And, and the truth is, you know, if all you knew about was Deutsch Joza, like it is not at all obvious why there is any net gain. Exactly, to, exactly. To because, together, right? because it seems like you've actually yeah. done a slight where you said, well, I'm going to work in yeah. a world right. where my query complexity is larger. Because yeah. uh, another way yeah. you could say, oh, here's a way, I, here's an allowable query. I'm just going to write a really large vector, evaluate F on every component of that vector, and mm -hmm. that's my new query. So of course you're going to be able to get away with fewer yeah, queries. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Okay, but 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 yeah. again, we're, we're, remember, we're still subject to the limitation that at the very end, you have to make a measurement on your state mm -hmm. to get an, a classical output, right? Mm -hmm. And if I just had an equal superposition over all the different answers, and I just, me, me, oh, let, let me let me show sure. you what that would look like. Yeah, sure, okay? sure. Okay. So let's say that I have, you know, N qubits. So now I, I could easily create an equal superposition over all possible N bit strings, which will look like this, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you know, and, and I could get that by just taking my n qubits and hadamarding them all mm -hmm. like this. Yep, 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 yep. Right? Uh, so this is an, an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I could even take a function and, and I could, uh, uh, let's say, a, 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 a black box function and evaluate it on the superposition. And that could give me a state that would look like this. Mm -hmm. Sum over all x of ket x tensor ket f of x. Right. Okay. Um, so I can sort of evaluate my function on all possible inputs in superposition, right? And, you know, and this is what makes the popular articles all excited, right? That, wow, <laughs> sounds like I get this free exponential parallelism, right? But so far, you know, I haven't yet done anything useful because if I now just measure this superposition, not having done anything else, okay, in the standard basis, then all I'm going to see is some pair x, f of x for a random x. Right. Okay. Let's just, let's just call it x, was... x star or something like that. There's just some x yeah, star, yeah, you sure, just get one sure, value. Good. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, good, right. And if that was all I wanted, then I could have just flipped the coin a bunch of times. <laughs> sure. You took the bits of x, and That's I could right. have saved all the billions of dollars to build this quantum computer, Sure. right? So, so the only hope of getting a speed up from a quantum computer is going to be to do something else afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. Which is going to have to be some unitary transformation on this vector that is going to choreograph a pattern of interference that's going to cancel out all the different contributions to the answers that I don't want. And it's going to produce constructive interference on the answers that I do want. Yeah, maybe right. let's pause here. Yeah, because yeah. because I think the key conceptual hurdle for me is that, mm. okay, so as you said, there's a difference between the unitary operator and then getting useful information through measurement. But I guess mm -hmm. what I'm struggling to understand is how would you build this unitary operator efficiently in the first place? Because naively to build it classically, you would have to build this matrix where you're evaluating F at every entry, but somehow yeah. by not yeah, yeah, no, having to right. measure, you avoid right. that computation. So how do you- Yeah, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. So that the, the, that part I can explain, right? Okay, okay. okay the, 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 this I can explain. Okay, so what do we mean by a, a quantum black box? So, 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 so the most common definition uh, would look like this. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, um, let me let me let me give it a name. So let's say that I have uh, uh, some uh, um, function f that I'm interested in. Then I could define a unitary transformation, which I'll call u sub f. Okay, and what's it going to do? All right. Well, um, you know, it should somehow take x and give me f of x. 
Okay, but now, you know, the catch is it's got it's still got to be unitary, right? So I can't just take X and overwrite it with F of X, right? Because, you know, if F is not a permutation, that, that then, that, then that won't be unitary, right? Even if it is, I still might not know how to apply that, right? You know, I might still have a, exactly the problem that you said, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I can't just take X and then write F of X next to it, because again, if I'm just saying take whatever was next to X and replace it by F of X, then that's also not unitary because it would destroy information. Whereas we know that every unitary transformation uh, is necessarily invertible, okay? So the definition that turns out to work is that I take F of X and I, uh, XOR it into an answer register, which is next to X. Okay, so I, I sort of write it into, you know, that, that answer register, you know, where if A was all zeros, then I'm just writing F of X here. Yeah. Okay, but if, if, if the answer register were, were initialized to something else, then I would just be overwriting, you know, I mean, I would just be XORing F of X into mm. that. Yeah, so okay. C naught is just U of F, where F is the identity, correct? Um. Um, C naught would be, would be U sub F where, where F is, uh, the, um, identity. Uh, yeah, 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 that's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Exactly. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so you do the C naught kind of thing, but, mm -hmm. you know, just generalize to any F right. And, you know, and this will be unitary. In fact, the square of this is just the identity, right. If, you know, because because you know mm -hmm. XOR yep. and gives me back uh, right. what I started with, right. um, and and now you know there, there's a further very crucial fact, okay, which is that if I have an efficient program for F, like just in the ordinary classical sense, but like I know how to compute F efficiently given X, then. I also get an efficient quantum circuit for U sub F. Okay. So, so whenever F is efficiently computable, then so is this U sub F. Okay. This is another theorem that one can prove. Yeah. What does this mean exactly? So let's going back to the C naught, right? So like, obviously the identity map is very efficient to compute, yet yeah. naively to compute U sub F, you have to kind of run through every uh basis right but you don't you okay. don't okay so let's, I'm, I'm let's saying that yeah. you don't okay? yeah sure i'm saying that whenever i have an efficient algorithm for f mm -hmm. you know so so that's not going to be for every f right, right sure sure yeah. sure but but but, but whenever f is something that is efficiently computable then u sub f is as well all right ah, so maybe okay. it would be maybe it would be instructive to to go through why that is perfect. yes exactly okay. exactly so the first the first thing to say is that there are quantum gates that can you know that can that can um, simulate like a universal set of classical gates like the and or and not gates. Mm. Okay? okay. So you know so and or and not are universal for classical computation, right? Like any when I say that F is efficiently computable, I mean that it has a small circuit made of and or and not gates. Okay. Right? Okay. And and um you know which is which is sort of equivalent to you know in the in this sort of non-uniform sense to there being a polynomial time algorithm for f mm -hmm. right okay and and now uh there is this gate called the toffoli gate okay toffoli looks like this it's the controlled controlled not gate mm. okay and um uh and so it's just the generalization of the C naught gate to three qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it just says like, if I have three qubits, X, Y, and Z, then I want to flip the third qubit. If, and only if the first mm -hmm. two qubits are both one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And otherwise do nothing. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, uh, uh, and, and now the, the key is that, is that this, this can now simulate an AND gate. Right. Because like if I initialize mm -hmm. Z to zero, then what is going to be written in the third qubit? It's just the yep. and X and Y. Right. It can also simulate a not gate. Right. Because like if I just wrote if I if I put ones into X and Y, then this is just going to map Z to not Z. 
right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once I have and and not, then that's a universal set of classical logic gates, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I can now do any, by chaining together enough toffelies, I can do any classical computation that I want, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. quantum computation can simulate classical computation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've said, uh, this is kind of like, you could use the space shuttle to drive around the sure. parking Right. That's it, right. It, 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 it's, it's that kind of you know sure. theorem. OK, but now so now, um, you know, remember what we wanted. We wanted to take X comma A and map it to X comma A exclusive or with F of X. Mm -hmm. Right. So now um, our, 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 you know, and, and we know that we can compute F via some uh, 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 let's say by assumption, you know, we can compute F by some short sequence of Toffoli gates, mm. right? But now are, are we done? Well, not quite, okay? There's one more detail that we have to worry about. So the, so, so the one thing that we, 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 uh, that we still have to worry about is that, you know, after I, uh, so, so I can take my input X and I can do some network of Toffoli gates, which I'll, you know, just, just to draw it schematically, it'll look something like this and blah, this, 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 and so on. Um, uh, I can do some network of Toffoli gates, which will give me, you know, X, the answer that I want, F of X. So, you know, I may I initialize these qubits to zero or something, but then there could also be all kinds of scratch work, which is left over. Uh, and the technical term for all of that stuff is garbage. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, we could have a lot of garbage bits left over in addition to F of X. And so now I do not have the unitary that I want because I've got all this garbage still hanging around. And in quantum computing, that's actually a huge problem. Garbage can prevent the interference phenomena that you want from occurring, right? And, and in any case, it means that I have not achieved the definition from before, okay? But now, fortunately, there's a trick to deal with it, okay? The, the, the trick is, well, you just have to clean up after yourself, okay? If you leave garbage, you just have to clean it up, okay? But how do you clean it up? So now that the, the but, key but trick... Is it, okay, is this a schematic? It's not, it's not a product of X, garbage, and F. Otherwise, you could just Well, it's a tensor right? product. Oh, I see. I mean, I mean, I mean, X. No, oh, oh, so sorry. Oh, right, 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 right. So, 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 if X were a classical string, right? Mm -hmm. I was assuming that X were, was just a classical basis state. Then what we will end up with is a tensor product. Oh, I X, see. Tensor garbage, tensor f of X. However, ultimately, we want to be applying this to a superposition. Got it. X, yep, 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 right? yep, yep. And I then see. the garbage is now entangled. Yes. With X yes. Yes. And with f of X, and that, and that's the problem. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's why we need to get rid of it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So the key trick for doing this was actually invented by Charlie Bennett in the 1980s and it's called uncomputing or computing in reverse. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and so what, so, so what you're going to do is you're going to take the final answer. Like, let's say the final answer is here. Uh, and after it's been, you know, f of x, after it's been computed, you're going to c-naught it. You're going to c-naught it into the answer register A. And then you're going to run your entire computation in reverse. Okay. So every gate that you applied, you're going to apply the inverse of that gate. Okay. Uh -huh. And you're going okay. to apply them in the reverse order as you applied them, you know, going forward. Okay. Okay. So like if you had this, you know, the Toffoli gate happens to be its own inverse. So, mm -hmm. you know, so that would just look like this. Okay. So the whole musical score reverses itself. Suppose you have whatever, right. you have this Toffoli yes. gate, and you, yes. right? And so you have some other stuff, whatever. So are you, is the reverse gate now the guy that's just the mirror reflection? Is that what you're calling in re yeah, 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 reverse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Saying, so okay. so if, if my, look, if my, yeah, okay. If my original sequence of gates was, let's say, G1 up to GK. Yep. Then my new sequence of gates is going to be GK inverse and then ah. GK minus one inverse and so on. 
Oh. Uh, and finally, G1 inverse. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just the right inverse of the of the associated unitaries. Yeah. There's yeah. literally the it's yeah. literally the inverse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just call it right. the flight. Right. Right. And now, yeah. so now the key is, you know, if I had just applied the unitary and then it's inverse with nothing in the middle, I would have just done a very <laughs> fancy implementation of the identity. Yes. Right. But I was careful to write down to copy the answer. At the very, you know, in the in the middle. Oh, right? that's brilliant! And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And so now, what I end up with is just my input x, and then a xor with f of x, mm -hmm. right? Which is which is what I wanted. Okay. So so that 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 is the uncomputing trick. That is how, given any efficient algorithm for f, I get an efficient quantum circuit for querying f on a superposition mm -hmm. of inputs. Okay. So I get u sub f. Okay, I think okay. I yeah, I think I, I know enough to fill in the details, but let me just verbally state. So okay, so okay. basically, right. by since f by hypothesis was simple yeah. to compute classically, you yes. you, you yes. stack the appropriate quantum gates to implement yes. f. Basically, yep. you kind of shove it into a, a CNA gate in some sense, so that you can kind or so that you can kind of have this um, uh, mm -hmm. scratch bit that will record f. Right, yep. and then you yep. do this reversing trick to erase all the yep. intermediate stuff you don't care about, and boom, yeah, there you go. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, so now to explain the Deutsch Joza algorithm. Okay, mm -hmm. the one further detail that I need to say is that um, we can, if if f is a Boolean function, so like if the output of f is just mm -hmm. a, a zero or a one, then I can actually have um, this behavior where I will take F and I will write it into the amplitude of the basis state X, okay? So I will multiply the amplitude of ket X by minus one to the F of X power, right? And how do I do that, right? Well, mm. one way to do it, all I, all I have to do, I actually give this as a homework exercise in my, you know, undergrad quantum computing course, but I'll, 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 I'll give it as a freebie. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. uh, so all, all, it turns out all you have to do is just do that use of F that I explained before, mm -hmm. but now have, you know, initialize a, the answer register to the plus state. Ah, uh, yeah. Here. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. let me let me yeah. just so, so here is X. Okay, and what you can show, you know, is is that the the answer register will always be left in the plus state. Um, you know what? <laughs> Not the plus state, the minus state. I'm sorry, the minus state. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, plus yeah, yeah. Not going to work. Minus yeah. state. Okay, so I initialize the the uh, um, answer register A to the minus state. Okay, and then the minus state has the property that. Uh, uh, well, if you apply a not gate to it, then it maps minus to right. minus, minus. Right. The point, right. the special thing about the minus state is that whenever a, whenever there's a bit flip, mm -hmm. there's a sign change. That's exactly what right. what minus one of the yeah. f is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 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 it so it does this, and, and this is in practice. You know, when f whenever f is a Boolean function, this is often how we want to think about a query to f. You know, okay. as just writing writing the answer into the amplitude. Okay. You know, I yeah. So the thing is that the only uh, quantum computing book that I've consulted, mm -hmm. based on my uh, you know non experience with the subject, has been uh, mm -hmm. Nielsen and Schwang. Uh, yeah. I, I should look at your book, of course, but I've only looked at Nielsen and Schwang, and they don't go into it. all all this backfill would have been so helpful yeah. for me because I was oh, like all right, enamored all right. by this black. Well, box yeah, no, no, there, there are there are plenty of books that explain okay. this. You could also look at my yeah. my my undergrad lecture notes. You know, okay. actually, it is actually mm -hmm. even more so than quantum computing since Democritus, because that was kind of. You know, the, the, those the, the my Democritus book was based on uh, uh, lectures that I had given for students who already knew all this stuff. And it, it, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Explain some, you know, something more philosophical to them. But my my uh, undergrad lecture notes that are on my homepage, I do I do carefully explain all of this. Great, okay? great. Okay. So all right. So now you know, knowing that we can make those phase queries, right, and mm -hmm. that it only costs the same as a normal query. Okay. Now, what is the Deutsch Joza algorithm, right? Well, um, so now what we're going to imagine is that f is just a function mapping one bit of input to one bit of output, like that, okay? 
So, you know, there are only four possible such functions, right? There's the constant zero function, the constant one function, the identity function, and the not function, right? Okay, and now what do we wanna know? We wanna know with a parity of f of zero and f of one, okay? So this is what we want, okay? And now we can ask how many queries to f are necessary and sufficient to get this information, you know, the XOR of the two different F values, right? And like, you know, if, if I ask this classically, like this is a, this was a completely trivial question, right? The answer is two queries, right? Uh, you know, I can, I, I, I have a choice, I guess, of which one to learn first, right? But whichever one I learn, I still got to learn the other one, right? Or else I don't know their parity, right? So we could say the classical query complexity of this problem equals two, okay? And now what we wanna prove is the remarkable result that the quantum query complexity of this problem is only one, okay? So it is half of the classical query complexity. Okay, and this is, this is the, you know, this was historically the first example of a quantum speed up in query complexity. As I said, not very impressive. It is merely by a factor of two, which normally in theoretical computer science, like we, we you know, we, we don't even bother to count constant yeah, factors. Yeah, I think, right? I think uh, historically, this was the first case uh, that Deutsch worked out by himself, right? So this is another Deutsch this algorithm. Was, this was actually, actually Deutsch's didn't even do this because it oh. only worked with half probability. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this okay, is still a then, special case. And then no, and then and then and then Deutsch and I think Deutsch and Joza kind of corrected it later. To, I see. Know, By the way, I, I've been saying have I been oh. saying his name wrong? I, I've said Yoja, but is it Joj? Is it J yeah, R J O? Oh, I see. Yeah. I, I wish you corrected me earlier. I just thought yeah, that yeah. some of the yeah, J. Yeah, no, no. Like then then then, okay. then there is a generalization of it to okay. n bits, but okay. yeah, that that to me is not. Um, you know, it, it's it's again going to be a constant separation if we do a fair comparison between the quantum algorithm and a classical probabilistic algorithm. So it's, you know, okay. so, so, so we might as well just do the case with one bit, I think. I see. Okay. Yeah, 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 of so, course. Yeah. Let's just keep it yeah. simple. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, even simpler, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now how are we going to learn? So, so now this is the question. How are we going to learn the XOR of two bits using only one query, right? Well, mm. clearly we can't just query the bits one at a time. Right, we're going to have to query them in superposition. Okay, what I'm going to do, well, I can just write this. I can just write it in circuit notation, and then we can talk through it. Okay, so I'm going to start with a qubit in the state zero. I'm going to Hadamard that qubit, which puts it into the plus state, the equal superposition of zero and one. Okay, and then I'm going to query f. So I'm going to apply that u sub f. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can see that I've taken the answer qubit and I've initialized it to the minus state in order to get that uh, um, phase query behavior, right? Uh, and then there's just going to be one more Hadamard gate, and then there's going to be a measurement. Okay. This is the entire Deutsch Joza algorithm. Okay, now we just have to explain what it's doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, all right, so so as I said, the 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 zero qubit is going to be mapped by the Hadamard to the plus state, which is also called zero plus one over the square root of two. Okay, now we're going to apply this u sub f, which as I said is going to uh, act as a phase query, uh, which is going to do this. It's going to give us. Okay, so now you're keeping track only of the first bit, right? You, we, we've kept the minus bit fixed on yeah, the second. Yeah, that's right. right? That's okay. right. Yeah, just, exactly. Just, okay, okay. I don't care about the The only purpose of the second qubit was to get this phase for a query on the mm -hmm. first qubit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this is actually a very common thing in quantum algorithms. So, mm -hmm. so Deutsch Joza actually has a structure that recurs in from one quantum algorithm to the other, like. Step one is to just create an equal superposition over all different inputs. Step two is make a query on that superposition, right? Mm -hmm. Step three is throw away the answer to the query. And then you say like, wait a minute, what? You know, what was the point of making the query if I don't even look at the answer, 
right? If I throw away the answer register like that, mm. okay? Well, it was the only reason I cared about the query was because of the effect that making the query had on my input register. Can, can you uh, map your terminology to what's going on in the circuit here? So this is the, this yeah. is- uh, so, so the first, the top one is the input register. Yeah, okay, yep. Okay? Mm -hmm. The second one is the answer register. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I am making a use of F is applying a query that will write the value of F of zero or F of one into the answer register. Mm -hmm. But the only reason I care about that is because of the effect that it will have on the input register. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, again, this is very, very common, you know, Simon's algorithm, Bernstein Vazirani algorithm, Shor's algorithm, you know, the core of Shor's algorithm, mm -hmm. uh, Grover's algorithm, they all have that same kind of character. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Um, so just yeah, just to wrap this up. So you only care about this guy, and this 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 thing is just yes. you, you, it doesn't matter what's going yeah. on anymore. Yeah. That's right. It doesn't yeah. matter anymore yeah. what's going yeah. on in the answer register. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. And and now what we're doing is okay. So 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 I applied U sub f, and in order to get this state here, which it was what looks like minus one to the f of zero, zero plus minus one to the f of one, one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now what I'm doing here is I'm taking that qubit and I am measuring it in the Hadamard basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I mean, you know, that's what a mm -hmm. Hadamard followed by a measurement means, mm -hmm. right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm checking to see like, is that qubit plus or minus? Right. Mm -hmm. And now here is the key observation. Okay. Suppose that F of zero equals F of one, right? which is to say, suppose that their parity is zero, okay? Mm -hmm. If F of zero equals F of one, then this state at the bottom here is the plus state. Yes. Right? Well, it's either the plus state or else it's minus the plus state, which as we said, is just the same thing since global phase doesn't matter. Yes. Right? Okay. Now suppose on, on the contrary, that f of zero is different from f of one, which is to say, suppose that the parity is one, mm, okay? Mm -hmm. In that case, um, uh, this state down here is the minus state, right? Because I've got either zero minus one or else I've got minus zero yep. plus one, right? Which is either the minus state or else minus the minus state. Yes, okay? so let me just write this but, out in cases. All right, so this is, now, this is either gonna be plus if f yep. of zero equals f of one, yep, or, or plus or, or, or you're proportional, uh, I guess maybe yep. uh, pro mm -hmm. proportional to, mm -hmm. and then yep. it'd be minus, yeah, if f of zero is not equal to right. f of one, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that 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 that's the Deutsch Jose algorithm. That's yeah, and in terms of the accounting, it's sort of like four became two because the overall phase didn't matter. I don't know if that's the right way to think of it, but I'm just looking at the, yeah. the numerology right now. Yeah, right, right. You can also say like, like we only got out one bit at the end. Like if we had wanted both F of zero and F of one, right? We could not have gotten both of them, right? right. But you know, the one bit that we got out happens to have been the parity of F yes. of zero and F of one, right. which is the one bit that we wanted. Yep. Okay, yeah. so, so that, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is like if you just, you know, explicitly wrote out all of the contributions to the amplitudes, you could say, um, uh, look, you know, when I, when I make this measurement at the very end, you know, there are, there are sort of two different contributions that could have given me, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the output that is not the parity, but they canceled each other out. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. of them, you know, was positive and the other one was negative. Mm. Right. And okay. so, so I get a destructive interference. Like if I, if I, if I, if I just multiply out the matrices explicitly, then I'll see that. Like, uh, you know, I, I would like if F of zero equals F of one, for example, then I could calculate the final amplitude of the state uh, of the output one as like a half minus a half. Mm, right mm, so it'll mm. be zero right mm. so whereas whereas the final amplitude of this the, the state zero which is the output i wanted that one will be a half plus a half mm. so it'll be one okay so in this case i get perfect constructive and destructive interference right mm -hmm. it you know it 
gives me an amplitude of one on the correct answer, the one I wanted, and it gives me an amplitude of zero on the incorrect answer. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. 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 You say like th this is like the paradigm case, right? And then yes. in every other quantum algorithm, you know, you are trying to you know, for some much more interesting and more impressive problem, but you're trying to do something that in the best case will be approximately like that. Mm. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow, this is this is great. So actually, I think maybe okay. this is a good segue into what BQP is, because I think you just basically oh, alluded sure. to that, right? You just yeah, walked yeah. right yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, okay, okay so sure. let's just recap really quick. So we, okay, so we've, we've uh, set up the qubit language and, 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 and explain what's magical about quantum physics. We've now um, explicitly shown an example of where there's a quantum, uh, I mean, I mean sp speed or quantum complexity reduction through the query structure, let's say. Yeah. And then now uh, the next thing to do is to kind of take a step back and to look at what is the um, relationship between quantum complexity classes right. and 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 um, classical complexity classes, because because yeah. this isn't really well. First of all, this is not a useful problem. But second of all, this isn't really a speed up in any right. meaningful way in terms of like you know reducing right. the uh, search search complexity or whatnot, right? So I think right. uh, I mean what, what we talk about next will be clarifying. Right. Of that. I mean I mean yeah. I mean to be clear, computing parity can be useful, right? But it's just that all all, all that Deutsch Josa gives you is that you could compute the parity of n bits using n over two queries. Mm. Right. So it's a factor of two speed up. And then, you know, and the way that you would do it is you take your n bits, you just group that you you pair them off, you just, mm. you know, split them up into pairs, you mm. run Deutsch Shozo on each pair separately. Mm. Right. That, that that gives you your factor of two. Right. Mm. And mm. then it's not even kind of a real speed up because then you would have to, to get the final answer, you have to take the parity of all of those final bits anyway. Right. Mm. And, and there's another n over two. So it's only a factor of two savings in terms of query complexity, mm -hmm. not in terms of the total number of steps, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so a, 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 as you said, it's not really directly useful, right? The, the, the uh, Deutsch Joseph, but then, you know, and, 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 and there were people who saw it and said, you know, that that's probably going to be the general case, right? <laughs> you know, and it's just like, it, it it's, um, you know, actually, apparently, assignment. So, so Shor's out Shor's factoring algorithm uh, um, grew out of an earlier quantum algorithm called Simon's algorithm, mm. right? Um, and um, um, Simon's algorithm came about because Simon apparently looked at Deutsch Josa and at a, a later thing called Bernstein Vazirani. And Simon said, I, I, I really don't think that these quantum speed ups are, you know, are, are that impressive. And let me try to prove that kind of you never get a, an exponential quantum speed up for like a, you know, any, you know, in, in a truly interesting sense. And that turned out to be false. And, <laughs> Simon, and Simon's algorithm was the counter example. Okay. Mm. It was still for a quite artificial problem. But in that case, it was an exponential speed up where you can show that any classical algorithm, even a probabilistic classical algorithm, you know, must make at least like two to the n over two queries to this function f in order to learn a certain property of it. Whereas there is a quantum algorithm that makes only n queries. So Simon's algorithm was the first example of an exponential speed up for one of these query complexity or black box problems mm. okay that, that you know it had that it was this kind of reduction okay and then the story goes that simon you know, uh, submitted his paper about that to you know one of the the premier conferences of theoretical computer science which is called stock or fox and uh, it was rejected okay it was rejected because People said, well, this is just this, this black box model, right? Like, who knows if this is telling us anything about the real world, right? And, you know, it doesn't seem that interesting, okay? But there was one guy on the program committee who said, I think it is interesting, and that was Peter Shore. <laughs> and so then Peter Shore said, well, it seems clear that if you just change the black box problem to one that looks a little bit different, uh, that's like about, uh, 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 you know, finding a hidden structure in a different abelian group, 
like Z, Z mod N instead of Z2 to the N, right? Then, uh, you know, you would get finding the period of a periodic function, right? You would get a fast quantum algorithm for period finding. And then, you know, it was obvious to Peter Shore, albeit not to most people, right? That if you could find the periods of periodic functions, then just through some classical number theory, you would also be able to quickly factor large numbers mm, and mm. Then calculate discrete logarithms. Okay, which would then break you know most of the cryptography that is relied on for the you know on the on the internet. Okay, mm. so you know and and now to work out all the details of that you know took sure like a year. Okay, mm. so <laughs> you know, he had to figure out you know what is a small circuit for the quantum Fourier transform, for example. Okay, but you know, he ultimately did all of that. And, and that was, you know, that was then what put quantum computing kind of on the map as a, mm. as a field, ra rather than just as, as an idea that, you know, a few oddballs had looked into. What, what year was that? What, what, uh, years? That was 1994. I see. Okay. When, when Shor's so that, algorithm came out. That, yeah, that, 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 that is when Shor's algorithm came out. Right. Okay. And, that, and that's, um, um, so, um, um, yeah, I think uh, uh, Simon's algorithm was actually earlier in 1994. So that was okay. kind of okay. a, a, a crucial year for for, for the mm. history of quantum computing, right? Okay, okay. Uh, okay, but so so now um, you, you ask me, you know, what is BQP? Yeah, right. right. So, right. so in some sense, you know, BQP, um, well, it stands for bounded error quantum polynomial time. And I'm not going to try to write that with my fingers, okay? <laughs> sure. but, but uh, that is the the central object of study in quantum computing theory, mm -hmm. um, um, and you can think of it as the class of all of the problems that are efficiently solvable using a quantum computer. Right so up to up to you, some up to some bounded error. Up to some bounded error, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you know we will allow the quantum computer to make, you know, to have, if, if, you know, so, so, so formally it's a class of only of yes or no questions, like mm -hmm. uh, what we call decision problems in computer science. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is, this is not a huge, this is not as big of a restriction as you'd think, because many other problems can be phrased as decision problems. Mm -hmm. Right. So actually, like, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Actually, so I was like, wondering. Like, yeah. The, the oh. bounded error, how essential is that? Yeah, yeah. So that that is pretty essential, mm, actually, okay. because uh, so you know because because in practice most you know so 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 the Deutsch Joza algorithm, which we saw, was an exact quantum algorithm, right? It had no error in it. Okay, mm, most right, with right. most quantum algorithms, we do not get that lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay, mo with most quantum algorithms, the interference that we're able to arrange is you know, is pretty good, but not perfect, right? Which means that there will be some probability of measuring and seeing the wrong answer, okay? But, you know, computer scientists have understood since the 1970s, if not earlier, right? That as long as the probability of a wrong answer can be bounded, you know, is small, then it's just not a big deal at all. Mm -hmm. And the reason is simply that you always have the option to repeat your algorithm a whole bunch of times and then output the majority answer. Sure. Just right? like if you had a bias coin with a slight edge, you could just keep flipping it over and over until the uh, the overall edge you, you yeah. get is, exceeds yeah. whatever threshold yeah, you exactly, have. Right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, ju yeah. it's just the law of large numbers, right? right? Mm -hmm. So like as long as on every input, your algorithm has at least a two thirds chance of getting the right answer, right? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, if you want to be more confident than that, then all you do is you rerun the algorithm, say, a thousand times, right? right? And in computer science, we don't really care about a thousand. That's just some constant factor, right? right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you take the majority of all the outputs. And at that point, the chance that, that you know, your computer would have, uh, uh, you know, the chance that your algorithm would have given you the wrong answer because of some gigantic fluctuation you know, uh, is probably smaller than the chance that like an asteroid would have just hit your house at that exact sure, moment. Right? Sure. So, so you're, you're not really worried about it anymore. I, how about this? Uh, in terms of complexity, class, if you did not yeah. allow bounded error, do we know that to be strictly a subset of BQP? 
Well, we we you know uh, we we know almost nothing to be strictly a subset of. Oh, okay. <laughs> because like we don't we don't even know that P is strictly a subset of P space, I, for example. Oh, I see. Right? All of it, although this is so, about determinism and not determinism, so I thought maybe there'd be yeah, a different yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of. Uh, no, no, right, right, uh, yeah, but yes. right, but uh, 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 but but now like like if if we if we looked at the version with no error, which mm -hmm. is called EQP or mm. exact quantum polynomial time okay like in some sense like like, like it, it's not even very well defined as a complexity class and the reason for that is that you know you which eqp you get might depend on your choice of gates okay oh. so like, like which so so depending on which set of gates you allow you might get a different set of problems that are exactly solvable right yeah. Whereas with BQP, you don't have that problem. Wouldn't okay? you solve that problem by like taking the union over all circuits or something? Well, like yeah, that? but you still need some way to specify which gate you have at a given moment, right? Mm, okay. Like you, you like 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 you're you like again, you need a classical computer program that can output a description of the quantum circuit, okay? Mm, which mm. means it needs some finitary way to refer to the gates, hmm. right? And if there's a okay. whole continuum of gates then most of the gates will have no finite description, hmm. right? Hmm. Okay, okay. So, okay. So, so you could say, all right, I want to allow all gates with rational, you know, uh, matrix entries, or I want to allow, you know, just this particular finite collection. Oh, I, of see, gates, I see, or, I see, or, I see. Or, or, or you could even say all gates with, with computable entries, or, you know, there's some I issues see. with that, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and then, you know, you're, uh, as far as anyone knows, you know, you're, the um, um, EQP might be sensitive to, to those kind of mm. low level choices, right? I see, I see. And now, now the truth is that, that in actual practice, Build, in building a quantum computer, none of that would ever matter. Right, right? because there's already because, noise and, and things yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You've, got, you've got so much noise in the system <laughs> sure. anyway, right? Okay, got it, that, got you it. Know, and and so, so then, you know, in some sense, BQP is the much more robust and yes, natural complexity that makes sense. Thing, right? That's and it can be proven to be insensitive to those choices of like exactly which set of gates do you got have. It. So, you know, in computer science, one of the main things that we try to do is we try to understand the space of all computational problems and sort of organize that space in terms of uh, what are called complexity classes, right? Mm -hmm. Which are just the classes of problems that are solvable within different kinds of resource constraints, okay? So the most basic complexity classes are, first of all, there's P, which stands for polynomial time, Right. And this is just all of the decision problems, you know, so like families of yes or no questions for which there is some algorithm running on a standard computer, you know, that will solve, you know, deterministic, you know, that will solve each instance of the problem and that will use an amount of time that is polynomial in the length of the instance. Right. At most, the number of bits raised to some fixed power. OK, so examples of problems in P would be like I give you a graph, uh, I, you know, or like a description of a graph by a string of bits. Now, is that graph connected? Or not? Like, is every vertex reachable from every other? Right. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, like every undergrad in computer science would learn how to solve that problem. <laughs> by a, you know, breadth first search or depth first search or some you know, algorithm like that. Um, another example would be. I give you an integer written in binary. Is it prime or not? Right. That's a much more non-trivial example. Okay. That one was only proven to be in the class P in 2002 mm -hmm. in a breakthrough by Agrawal, Kyle, and Saxena. Right. It had been known long before that to have a fast probabilistic algorithm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but the the deterministic one was it was a big breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. so that's this, so that's yeah. yeah. Good. So, 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 so primes so, is in P, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. P. Yeah. And now the second most famous complexity class after that is called NP, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, uh, uh, and this is uh, um, you know uh, um, uh, intuitively it's the class of all of the decision problems for which whenever the answer is yes there is a short proof that can be efficiently checked, mm -hmm. okay? 
So, um, uh, so there doesn't, so I'm not saying that there has to be a fast algorithm to find a solution. I'm just saying that if there is a solution, if there is a positive solution, then it must be efficiently checkable, you know, once you've seen it. Okay. So a classic example of a problem in NP would be factoring. Like I give you a huge integer and I ask you to find its prime factorization, mm -hmm. right? Now, technically I would have to rephrase this as a decision problem somehow. Mm -hmm. Like I could ask, for example, does given this integer, does it have, uh, um, does it have a prime factor ending in a three? You know, right? You know, but but if if I if I can answer all the different yes or no questions about the prime factorization, then I can easily recover the prime factorization itself. So so often we'll just be sloppy and we'll just talk about factoring itself as an NP <laughs> problem, right? <laughs> and and so so now the key point is that you know given you know if I give you let's say a ten thousand digit integer. Right, no one knows any fast algorithm running on a conventional computer to find its prime factorization. Right, and every time we order something from Amazon or you know we visit any HTTPS website, you know our in our our in our data is being protected by a crypto system that depends on the belief that factoring and some closely related problems are hard, are not in P. Right, do not have polynomial time algorithms, okay? But, you know, the factoring problem is easily seen to be an NP, which means like if I, you know, uh, uh, claim to you that yes, this number does have a prime factor ending in three and you say, well, I don't believe you, right? There's always a way I could convince you of that, which is I just show you the factor, right? I say, here it is, okay? And now if you're given that factor, you can very easily check it I mean, first of all, I already said that primality testing is in P, right? So you can check that it's prime, okay? And you can also check that it divides the input number, right? That's, you know, at, le at least using a computer, that's a very easy thing to do, is a division, right? So, 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 so the factoring problem is a perfect example of an NP problem, which might, you know, which, which, uh, uh, which might not be in P, Right, but but where the answers are easy to check. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now I should say that that uh, um, p is oh p is a subset of NP. Okay, so every uh, p problem is also an NP problem, and this is simply because well, if you can solve a problem yourself, then you know you you don't even need the witness, right, <laughs> for the yes answer, right? The witness to the yes answer can just be the empty string. Or something, right? right? So, okay. And now the super famous question that sort of is sort of the the defining question of theoretical computer science itself, if you like, is the question: Is this a strict containment? So, mm -hmm. is p equal to np? Okay. And um, you know, I uh, uh, hopefully you know I don't have to make the case to uh, people listening of the importance of this problem. I mean, it's been featured on The Simpsons and Futurama, you know. <laughs> I didn't know that, uh, okay. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah, it but has that, been. That's not the main reason it's yeah. famous, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. No, but it, it's one of the clay millennium problems. It's, uh, uh, you know, and, and I, I would personally put it forward as the most important of the clay millennium problems, okay? And the, the argument for that is simply that, well, if P equal to NP, and via an algorithm that was very efficient in practice, then it would not only mean, you know, and, and you could prove that, it would not only mean that you could solve that clay problem, it would mean that you could program your computer to solve the other six. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. right, you could just sure. say, is there a proof of the Riemann hypothesis that is at most like, you know, that is in some formal language like ZF set theory, you know, that is at most a hundred million symbols long, right? And if such a proof exists, then you know you should be able to find that in time that is linear or quadratic or whatever in a hundred million, right? And so on for every other mathematical question. Okay, so so in some sense, P versus NP is really asking about to what extent can mathematical creativity itself be completely automated, right? <laughs> um, you know, can uh, a, 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 as soon as I tell you that a 
problem is efficiently that that solutions to it are efficiently checkable does that also mean that the solutions are efficiently findable okay and most of us would conjecture that the answer is no you know i like to say that if we were physicists we would have just declared that to be a law of nature and you know maybe given ourselves nobel prizes for it okay but you know uh, uh, by mathematical standards it it has to be called an open problem <laughs> Okay, so so now now a, a, a major role in this story is played by uh, what are called the NP complete problems. Okay, so let me just put at the very top of NP, um, drawing the line to not include factoring. Okay, uh, these um, these NP complete problems. Uh, uh, um, informally, these are the hardest problems in NP. Okay, and what that means is a problem is NP complete if number one, it's in NP, and number two, an efficient algorithm for that problem uh, could be efficiently transformed into an efficient algorithm for any other NP problem, right? And so, you know, th that sounds like a weird concept the first time you hear it, right? Because it's like a priori, like, is it even clear that there are any NP complete problems? Right, but it, it what 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 turned out in the early 1970s was that not only do there exist NP complete problems, okay, but the great majority of the problems that people care about in like combinatorial optimization and you know scheduling and and uh, and all kinds of practical fields are NP complete, okay. So you know three coloring a graph. Like, you know, color a map with three colors so that no two neighboring countries are colored the same. You know, or I, I give you a map and I ask, can that be done? That is an NP complete problem. Um, I give you the social network of Facebook and I ask you, are there, you know, a thousand people who are all friends with each other, right? Find the maximum clique in this graph. That is an NP complete problem. Okay. I give you the dimensions of a bunch of boxes and I ask, can all of these fit into the trunk of your car? You know, that is called packing. That is an NP complete problem. Yeah. Some people might have experience with that being a, you know, a hard combinatorial problem. Okay. Um, a minesweeper, you know, if you've played that, turns mm -hmm. out to be NP complete, right? A Sudoku. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, and much more significant things like finding a, a proof of a theorem of, of, of bounded length, right? Okay, and, and so, so um, if, uh, um, if any NP complete problem were in P, then all of them would be, and then in fact, P would equal NP, right? If any one of them is not in, in, uh, in, in, in P, then P is not equal to NP, okay? So those are the stakes. Um, and you know, and th these are not the only complexity classes. So, for example, you know, just above NP, e even above NP, we have this class called P space, hmm. which is everything that a classical computer could do with a polynomial in N amount of memory, but hmm. possibly an exponential amount of time, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. And uh -huh. then even above P space, we have what's called exp which is what you can do in an exponential amount of time and, uh, 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 you know, and possibly also exponential amount of memory. Okay. Right? So, okay. Now, now if you ask like which of these containments are strict, right? So what we know is that P is contained in NP, NP is contained in P space and P space is contained in X. OK, and now if you ask which of these are strict, well, we have known since the 1960s that P is strictly contained in X. OK, this is called the time hierarchy theorem. Mm. OK, it was proved by Hartmanis and Stearns. Hartmanis was one of the founders of uh, computational complexity. He just passed away this year. Mm. OK, um, but so, so now knowing that P is not equal to X, of course, that tells us that either P is not equal to NP or NP is not equal to P space or P space is not equal to X, right? At least one of those three must be true. Uh, most people's guess is that all three of them are true, mm. right? Mm. 
-hmm. that all, all of these containments are strict. But that is what, like, you know, it will take a revolution in mathematics before we are able to prove statements of that kind. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, these have all been open problems for more than half a, half a century. Okay. So, so now, you know, into this, you could say that, 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 that there's already, you know, incredibly like difficult and rich space comes waiting BQP, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or, you know, quantum polynomial time. And so now, of course, the key question of quantum complexity theory is, well, how does BQP fit in? Right. Like, or how does, you know, making things quantum actually, you know, change this picture. Right. And so, okay. So, so, um, um, so the, the first, uh, um, uh, you know, the, 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 this was exactly the question that Bernstein and Vazirani studied in 1993 when they, you know, wrote their, their now uh, seminal paper, which defined the class BQP. Right. And then kind of asked all the obvious questions about, well, where does it fit in? Right. And so, so some of the things they showed are that, first of all, BQP contains classical P. Right. This is, this is not a great surprise. Right. I already told you about how the Toffoli gate can be used to simulate classical computation. Right. So, okay. So, whatever a classical computer can do in principle, a quantum computer can do as well. It might be ridiculous overkill to, you know, to use it for right. that. It's okay. not even in principle, it's an explicit algorithm to do it. Yeah, that's yeah, right. right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. right. That's okay. Right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. And then now another thing that they showed is that BQP is contained in P space. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so they showed that, that, you know, you can always take a, uh, an efficient quantum algorithm, and you can simulate it classically, um, possibly using exponential time, um, but in any case, using a polynomial amount of memory. I'm trying to think, I see, because I'm trying to think, if you did all these matrix multiplications, you never need more than, than to store, uh, you know, um, like maybe like one bit at a time or something like this. Is that the yeah, intuition? Yeah, kind of like that, right. So, okay, so, so may, uh, maybe, maybe to step back, the first point I should make is that BQP is contained in X, right? Okay. So, you know, so, right. I mean, I mean, you know, that, that, that would be the, the weaker result here. Okay. Right. So anything that a quantum computer can do in polynomial time, a, uh, um, a classical computer can also do in exponential time. Sure. Right. Right. Uh, which means that there is, you know, qu quantum computers cannot change the theory of computability. Like there cannot be a quantum algorithm for the halting problem, for example, because if there were, then there would also be a classical algorithm, sure. which is what Turing proved was impossible, right? right? And why do we know this? We know this because you can always just take a quantum algorithm and simulate it classically by just writing out the entire exactly. quantum state writing right. out the entire wave function, right. you know, and, 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 you know, there is one little observation that you need to make, which is that you don't need to represent the amplitudes to infinite precision, right? Just, you know, because of the assumption of bounded error, you know, uh, in, the yep. BQP, in the BQP, right? It yep. is enough to mm -hmm. represent each amplitude to just, you know, a reasonable number of bits of precision, right? right? And right. then, you know, you can just in, in, exponential memory, just write down the entire amplitude vector, and then simulating the quantum computation is a simple matter of doing a bunch of matrix vector multiplications, yep. mm -hmm. right? Yep. Okay, and, and so, 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 okay, but then, then you know, Bernstein and Vazirani uh, proved a stronger result. They showed that BQP is contained in P space. Now, um, uh, uh, why is that true? Well, for anyone who has studied physics, I could say the answer in one phrase. It's because of the Feynman path integral, right? Okay. Uh, we could say, you know, it, it is because you can always, you know, in quantum mechanics, if you're trying to calculate oh. an amplitude, you I can see. always write the amplitude as a sum over exponentially many different contributions. I see. And right? so if, since you have a cumulative sum, you just need to keep track yeah. of a state at, at one state at a time, essentially. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. You can yeah. then evaluate that sum by just reusing the same memory over and over. Yeah. And, just, you know, and I think explicitly what I said in terms of like, you know, yeah. to keep track of a 
matrix multiplication, you know, you can kind of do things like, you know, like entry by entry or something like that. So you're scratching. Yeah, that that's finite. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. That's right. That's yeah. a, that, 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 that would be a different way of, 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 yeah. say, of, of saying it. Yeah. 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 So, um, okay. Now, now the fact that BQP is contained in P space tells us something else that is very important. Okay. It tells us that in our current state of knowledge of complexity theory, we have no hope of proving uh, unconditionally that BQP is larger than P. Right. So you could say like, like, you know, a central goal of quantum computing ought to be just prove that you can do something in quantum polynomial time that you cannot do in classical polynomial time. Right. Mm, so prove mm. that P is strictly contained in BQP. Right. I will put this as a conjecture. Right. Okay. okay. Now, Certainly, like if you believe that factoring, so, so okay, so so Shor's great achievement was to show that the factoring problem is in BQP, right? Factoring has a polynomial time quantum algorithm, okay? So if you believe that factoring is not in P, then that would mean that, you know, BQP is larger than P, right? Okay, but, you know, uh, we have no hope of proving unconditionally in our current state of knowledge, the BQP is, is larger than P. Why is that? Well, it's because we can't even prove that P space is larger than P. Right? <laughs> you can say like, it, you know, it's not our fault as quantum computing people. Got it, right? got it's it. It's like the, the progress is blocked by even just our lack of understanding of how to prove separations in classical complexity. Got it, yes. Okay, yes. so, okay, so, okay. But now what else can we say about uh, BQP? So. So here is P, here's NP, uh, here's P space. Yeah, and I guess the way this is going to tie up is you're going to eventually point to what the quantum supremacy guys did in, 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 yes. in, in, in right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the NP complete problems. And now, um, uh, what does BQP look like? I like to draw it with a kind of wavy boundary since, you know, mm -hmm. everything quantum is, you know, spooky mm -hmm. and mysterious, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so here's our kind of our picture of where BQP would go. Okay. Uh, let me, let me put factor in here as just a big example of something that's uh, in, uh, um, uh, in BQP, but not known to be in P. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, a mate, you know, now you, you might be able to already see this from the picture, but a central open problem is what is the relationship between BQP and NP, mm -hmm. right? As far as we know today, they, they may be incomparable to each other, mm -hmm. okay? Neither containing the other, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, um, we do not know of an efficient quantum algorithm for the NP complete problems, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is equivalent to asking, is NP contained in BQP, right? Right. This is this is not known to be true, and most of us don't believe that it's true, mm, right? Okay, okay. And this is this is this is the precise point where most of the popularizations of quantum computing go off the rails, right? right, right. They they talk about Shor's algorithm as if it were just a simple matter of try all the possible solutions in parallel. And if that were true, then that would not just be for factoring, right? That would also work for the NP complete problems, right? right. But we don't think that, that it right. generalizes to NP complete problems, right? Sure, really had to take advantage of very, very special properties of factoring. Like I said, the fact that you can reduce it to finding the period of a periodic function, okay? So, okay, so, so, so that's, that's um, one direction. Then in the other direction, we also don't know whether BQP is contained in NP, okay? So, so this is the question, like if a quantum computer can solve a problem, then is there always at least a short classical proof of mm -hmm. the answer, right? Even if it's hard to find, or, or could quantum computers solve problems where the answer cannot even be efficiently checked by a classical computer, let alone found? Actually, right. if this, if this, if BQP yeah. were an NP, would that put quantum computing out of business? Or <laughs> what no. would that mean? No, 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 it wouldn't. If BQP were an NP, like you could still have that factoring would be in BQP, but not in P, for example, right? As long as P is not equal uh, to NP. Uh, 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 okay, 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 okay. I see, I see. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, 
Um, so, um, yeah. So, uh, um, you know, since so the question you're talking about is 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 a is you know uh, let me just write it explicitly uh, yeah. question. <laughs> question of is bqp equal to pig okay mm. so yeah but okay but now we're talking about the the question of can a classical computer always check the answer to a quantumly easy problem and we don't know and i would say we don't have very strong evidence one way or the other kind of in the real world we mm. have in the Oracle or black box world, we we do know something about this question, but uh, um, you know, I, I I personally think that this could go either way. Okay. 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 All right. So um, so so that that was a little bit about BQP and where it fits in with classical complexity classes. All right. So uh, so you know, you could say like like the long term goal in quantum computing research would be um, build a scalable quantum computer, you know, that is able to run, you know, Shor's factoring algorithm or something like that, right? And at that point, there is no more arguing with the skeptics who think that it's impossible, right? You just say to the skeptics, okay, just give me your 10,000 digit number, you know, I will give it you back, you know, the prime factors after a few minutes. And then, you know, you know, you must agree that either I have built a quantum computer or else I've done something else that is equally remarkable, right? right. You know, <laughs> and and you and you and you can check the prime factors for yourself, right? You don't have to take my word for anything, right? Okay, so we are clearly we are not there yet, right? And so we don't have, we don't yet have truly scalable quantum computers, you know, that can scale up to millions of qubits, right? And uh, you know, we could, you know, the 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 reasons why that's such a hard engineering problem, that would be a whole further discussion that could, you know, we could easily spend another couple hours on that, on de decoherence and quantum error correcting codes, you know, and then that's a whole nother story. Okay. But suffice it to say, you know, there's been remarkable progress in the 20 years or so that I've been in this field, you know, toward, you know, getting um, um, qubits that you can control well enough that then you can start using error correcting codes to, uh, simulate, you know, basically perfect qubits, you know, that you could, uh, that could maintain their superposition states for as long as you want, right? And, and that's kind of what we ultimately want in order to run quantum algorithms like Shor's algorithm and, you know, and do factoring and also to, to simulate quantum mechanics, which is, you know, maybe, you know, even more important uh, for, you know, industry or for, for practice, right? Than, than uh, reading other people's emails, right? Um, uh, uh, but you know, we, 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 uh, um, as an engineering matter, we are not yet at the point where we can build a scalable quantum computer with, you know, with thousands or millions of error corrected qubits. Uh, no one knows exactly when we'll get there. There are some people who are very optimistic that it will happen within the next decade. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and billions of dollars are now being invested in it by, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, um, dozens of startup companies. So, you know, if it fails, it's not going to be for lack of trying. Right? <laughs> okay. okay? Um, but, you know, what, where, where, where people are now is that they can build devices with, let's say, 50 or 60 uh, relatively noisy qubits, mm -hmm. right, that will not maintain their superposition state for arbitrary amounts of time. In fact, they'll only maintain it for, you know, let's say 20 or 30 microseconds, mm. something like that. Okay. But, you know, that could be enough to do maybe a, a circuit with a thousand or so gates. Okay. Mm. So now you start thinking like 50 qubits, a thousand gates, is that mm -hmm. already enough to do something that would be hard to simulate for a classical computer? Mm -hmm. And that would at least prove the point that, yeah, we can exploit this like vector space C to the two to the 50, right? We can exploit this, you know, quadrillion dimensional uh, 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 complex vector space to solve some problem where a classical, even a classical supercomputer would have a very hard time keeping up, okay? So, so that brings us to this, this, this milestone of quantum supremacy. Right. Uh -huh. So, 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 not everyone likes the name. Okay, but uh, the name was coined in um, 
uh, thank you. The mm -hmm. name was coined in uh, a decade ago by by John Preskill. Um, <laughs> listeners may have heard of uh, um, and uh, and and he was trying to codify uh, uh, a set of um, uh, uh, possible experiments that that, that that I and others had proposed uh, about a year before that okay and so so um, you know we had been thinking actually just about quantum complexity theory about you know things like BQP versus P right and and about like like what would be the most straightforward demonstration that you could do that a quantum computer is doing something that is hard to simulate classically, okay? And the key realization that we had, and this was, um, so, so this was um, me and my student, Alex, named Alex Arkhipov mm -hmm. um, in 2011, and then independently of us, uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard. Okay, at, 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 at around the same time. Um, um, we all kind of, you know, from different starting points kind of converged on this on this same idea, which is that it actually it becomes much, much easier to see the advantages of a quantum computer if you're willing to broaden your notion of what a computational problem is. Mm. Okay. So we we when, when we talked about BQP, we talked about decision problems, mm. right? Which are just problems where the answer is always yes or no, right? And I said that a lot of other problems can be encoded as decision problems, okay? But not quite all of them, okay? So there are also um, uh, another uh, class of problems in computer science is what are called sampling problems. Or like I described to you in some way a probability distribution, let's say over n-bit strings, and now your challenge is to output a sample from that distribution. Okay, so an example might be, you know, I give you a graph and I ask you to sample a random matching in that graph, right? Or I describe to you a convex body by like, you know, the, the equations of its bounding uh, 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 surfaces. And I ask you to sample a random point in the interior of that convex body. Right mm -hmm. now, you know the, these kind of problems have a long history in computer science. Uh, Knuth, you know, talks about them in you know the art of computer programming. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. um, but but now um, what what we realized is that if you're as soon as you talk about sampling problems, it could be much much easier to see the advantages of a quantum computer over a classical one, both theoretically like in the sense of separating the complexity classes of, you know, quantum sampling versus classical sampling. And also in the practical sense that it might be much, much easier to, to actually realize those kind of quantum speed ups in the lab. You might not have to build the full fault tolerant quantum computer that would be able to run Shor's algorithm. 50 noisy qubits mm. might already be enough to start seeing the advantages for some of these sampling problems, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was the key realization that some of us had um, 11 or 12 years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, so so um, um, Arkhipov and I, we had a proposal which we called boson sampling, mm -hmm. okay? Which was uh, uh, basically uh, to solve a sampling problem that involved uh, photonics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generate a bunch of photons, then pass them through some basically random, but polynomial sized uh, network of beam splitters, mm -hmm. and then just measure to see where the photons are. Is end this up. the same approach that the Google group used or did they use something it different? It is not. Okay, is not. okay. They were, they were inspired by it, but then they said, okay, but now in order to do boson sampling, we would have to spend a hundred million dollars to like re, you know, uh, redesign mm. our whole experiment. So we're going to do something, an analogous thing with superconducting qubits. Mm. And we will trust you, the theorists, to adapt your theory to our experiment. And we said, okay, we okay. can do that. <laughs> okay. okay. So, but, yeah. Um, okay. Uh -huh. I yeah. see. So, so, so the thing that Google did is now called RCS or random circuit sampling. Okay. Mm. And so, so, so you could say this, this boson sampling, which is what Arkhipov and I proposed mm -hmm. and this, um, um, 
uh, uh, what's called um, um, commuting Hamiltonians, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the Bremner, Joza, and Shepard proposal, and the random circuit sampling, which is what mm -hmm. Google ended up doing, right? They're all like at a very high level, they're all kind of a similar idea, right? Mm -hmm. That you, you, you sort of apply this kind of more or less random set of operations, you know, to just kind of scramble up your, the state of your qubits, get a kind of random looking state of your, of your qubits, but which will have little inhomogeneities in it. Like some output states will be somewhat likelier than others, right? right? Just because of, you know, inner, um, um, some of them just by chance, will suffer a little bit more destructive interference. Sure. And, I and think other the, ones by chance will enjoy a little bit more constructive yeah, interference. Yeah, and I think the point is, if I understand right, basically the probability density, right? Each of those terms are hard to compute classically. Yep. And so you exactly. know that if you get samples that are within some threshold of your true probability density, and you uh, the other key thing is you also know that the classical problem of approximation is also hard, or at least you believe it to be hard, then yep. then you sh that's how you sort of know yeah, that exactly, you had to get exactly. some quantum advantage, right? Exactly. So the point is, look, you know, a both a, you know, to, to actually calculate these, these, these uh, uh, final, you know, the probabilities of the final outputs in, in your, in your distribution that we expect to be an exponentially hard problem, mm -hmm. both for a quantum computer and for a classical computer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the, what the quantum computer can do just by construction is it can sample from the distribution. Right. Mm -hmm. And now what we did in the boson sampling paper is we gave theoretical evidence that even that sampling problem should already be exponentially hard for a classical computer mm. under some reasonable complexity assumptions, right? Which, mm -hmm. you know, it would take time to explain the details of that, okay? But um, so we gave some evidence that there is a separation between quantum and classical in terms of their ability to efficiently sample from these kinds of probability distributions. Mm -hmm. And so then that, that is what kind of suggested this, you know, and, and we came at this purely from complexity theory, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we weren't even thinking about doing a practical experiment, but then we started talking to quantum optics people and they got very excited about it. And so then, you know, we started realizing that, you know, maybe this could actually be done within like the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. What happened was that in, 2014, uh, Google hired John Martinez, mm. who was maybe like the top superconducting qubit experimentalist in the world. Mm. And they decided they're going to build like a 50 to 70 qubit chip that would mm. be you know, programmable uh, with, with using superconducting qubits. And, you know, and then they had the question, what do we do with that? And, you know, there, it's not obvious what you do with 50 qubits, right? Mm -hmm. But then they said, okay, maybe we can do something like boson sampling, but for, you know, adapted to uh, uh, superconducting qubits. So we had, we talked to them about that in 2015. We kind of ha helped hammer out the proposal of, you know, what exactly are they going to do? Uh, how do you verify it once you've done it, which is, you know, a major drawback of these experiments, because it does take exponential time with a classical computer, even just to verify, you know, the results. Okay. But, you know, with 50 qubits, you can still just barely do it, hmm. right? If you use a big supercomputer. Right. Okay. And then, you know, and then like, how do we know that the problem is hard for a classical computer or, you know, under, under, you know, are, are we, are we sufficiently convinced? Um, and then, you know, Google uh, worked on this experiment and in 2019, in late 2019, they announced that they had done it with uh, a 53 qubit chip, which they called Sycamore, which sampled from this dis probability distribution over 53 bit strings, which we do not know how to sample, you know, they, they estimated that it would take 10,000 right. years. Right. And, and this is where it got, I got a little technically, yeah. Yeah. From that same distribution, that mm -hmm. turned out to be kind of wildly over-optimistic or, right. or pessimistic. Right, because these are mm -hmm. estimates, right? Because what they have to do is because you have to, how I say, mm -hmm. because you still have to use a classical computer to check a hard problem, you and of course you don't have 10,000 years yep. to check, what you do is you yep. extrapolate, right? So you sort of approximate, yeah. you, you form a family of simpler and simpler problems and you sort of yeah. see what the trend is. And of course, if, right. you, if you weren't so precise with yeah, your but, estimates, but that, right? But that, but, that, but that was not even the sticking point. 
that was that was not the sticking point. Okay, so uh, um, um, you know, like like they with, with enough I mean, with enough computer power, they you know they could have done the full verification with 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 fifty three qubits. But it turns out that the reason that why they could have done it is that you know they also could have spoofed the results with fifty three qubits, right? So so basically, it it was just that their classical algorithm that they were that they had in mind to simulate the uh, experiment was not the best one, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And people then came up with, so, so, so the exper their, their experiment was fine, right? The experiment, you know, I sees see. the signal of, uh, um, you know, yeah. where, where you are correlated with the, the, you know, the, the outputs that you want to be, right? And it, it was an amazing experiment, right? I and see. I think, you know, from a, you know, tr truthfully, you know, scientifically, the most interesting thing that we learned from the experiment was not quantum supremacy itself. It was just that the errors behave in just, you know, in, in according to the most naive possible model, right? Where, where, you know, it's just the total fidelity of the circuit just goes like the fidelity of each individual gate raised to the power of how many gates there are. I see. Okay. So, which means, you know, and, and as long as that is true, then quantum error correction ultimately ought to work. I see. That, so, so supremacy, yeah. So, supremacy in some sense is really just a subjective term in that there's a threshold. <laughs> if they had just pushed yeah. it with a few more qubits, then then everyone would be happy. It sounds like. Well, no, no, or, because or no? because oh, okay. because okay. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, yes, more qubits would would, would would you know would help. But you know, the the trouble right now is because of the exponential cost of verification. Like, if you go to so many qubits. Like you know, eighty. Let's say that a classical computer oh, wouldn't I even see. have a chance. I then see. a classical computer can't also can't verify the answers. Got it. Right? Okay. So right now you're kind of stuck with this cat and mouse game, mm. where the difficulty of classical verification is linked to the difficulty of classical spoofing. I see. Right? I see. And so, so that so that kind of limits you, right? But uh, but but then you know the other issue is just that. There, you know, people, you know, even while the classical uh, uh, simulation time is exponential, people can get very, very clever about it, right? And they can do all kinds of tricks to cut it down to a milder exponential. Okay, mm -hmm. and that is exactly what we have seen in the past three years, mm -hmm. right? That people have used what are called tensor network methods to get a faster simulation, and 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 nowadays. Um, uh, we know that, you know, if you spent enough money on like AWS, right, or just buying enough, you know, classical computing time, then you could spoof the Google experiment, you know, in just a matter of seconds, <laughs> mm. right, mm, you know, like faster than the thing itself. But you would still be using hundreds of times more electricity than the quantum computer. I see. Uses, I see. Right? Okay. okay. And, you know, and, and the quantum computer is not exactly, you know, you know, I mean, it's already using a dilution refrigerator that's the size of a closet, right? Which is using like, uh, you know, um, 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 I think, you know, tens of, ki of kilowatts, right? But, you know, the classical supercomputer to simulate it, as far as we know, that, that could require megawatts. Okay, so so you are you know that so so in so, so in some sense you could say you still do have quantum supremacy. Let's say as measured by carbon footprint. Okay, right, right. Or, you know, I see. As I see. measured by uh, um, number of steps, right? But um um uh, uh by by total number of operations, right? So um um um. But but you know not as measured by wall clock time, and that's just because the classical simulations are so parallelizable, right? That like you know to, to it. do it faster and faster is just a question of cost, yep. Yep. just a question of how many chips, right? So yeah. so there are you know you do get into kind of you know annoying finicky questions about what is the exact definition of supremacy right. of beating a classical computer that's right, right? yeah uh, um you know is ultimately you know maybe ultimately the, the 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 question should be dollars right sure but uh, uh but um um now now the other key issue here is that there is a lot of um noise in in the circuit so each each of their two qubit gates in the google experiment for example has like 99.5 percent fidelity Right, yeah. meaning like only a one in two hundred chance of an error, 
right? Which is, you know, by the standards of like when I joined this field 20 years ago, right? You would have been thrilled to get 50% fidelity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's like amazing, okay? But it's still not good enough. Like if I have a thousand gates, I'm now taking 0.995 and I'm raising it to the thousand power, right? And then I end up with something that's rather small, right? And so this is exactly the issue with the Google experiment, right? That they just are able, they're able to measure a signal that is just a little bit distinguishable from purely uniform noise, hmm. you know, if they take millions of samples, right? Which, which they can do in, a, in about three minutes. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. But now there are classical simulations that can exploit the noise to run faster. Right. So so what the classical people say is, well, look, if the quantum computer, you know, mm. itself is noisy, then it's perfectly fair for our simulation to also be noisy. Right. And then it can run, you know, maybe it, it can run faster. Right. And so so all of the you know, we're still in the era when we're going to see back and forth claims and counterclaims about, you know, like to to what extent has quantum supremacy been achieved? The hope is that at some point quantum computing just completely pulls away, right? At least for those special problems where, you know, where, where it wins, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and that there's not even a, a, a comparison anymore, right? Uh, or, you know, the classical computers would have no hope of keeping up. But now a huge question, which I personally do not know the answer to, a huge question is, will the quantum computers be able to decisively pull away you know, in the current era of these noisy, non-error corrected devices, mm. right? Or will pulling away only be possible once you have a fully error corrected qubits, right? And that is a huge question where, you know, right now for better or worse, billions of dollars are riding on the answer to that question. Mm. Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, great. Mm. Thank you for that great summary right. of the, the field. That sure. We spent so much time talking. Uh, I wanted to thank you so yeah. much for, for sure. our interesting yeah, sure, discussion. Sure, sure. Yeah, this is very okay. informative. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, it was fun.